It's 8 o'clock on today. Coming up, all-out war. The death toll in Israel rising this morning after hundreds were killed in surprise attacks. Others now being held hostage. We're live with the latest. Then, remembering Michael Chiarello. I'll take a look back at the famed chef's career on and off the screen. I hear people say, oh, that's Chiarello, the olive oil guy. But I'm not afraid of a little butter. His death being blamed on an allergic reaction. This morning, the tributes pouring in for his extraordinary life. Plus, game on. We hit the stands for last night's big win by the 49ers with a very special group of their fans. When you signed up for a life with an NFL player, did you know what you were getting yourself into? I had no idea. Straight ahead, an inside look at these unique relationships with the NFL. And the way we weren't. The girl is lovely, Hubble. Barbara Streisand opens up about how Robert Redford almost didn't star in the classic Hollywood love story as the icon reveals all in a new memoir. We've got the details coming up in Pop Start today, Monday, October 9th, 2023. Sisters trip from Massachusetts and Colorado. Sisters, Sisters celebrating our sweet 16 from Austin, Texas. From Richmond, Virginia. Hey, I turned 10. On a girl's trip from New Orleans. To celebrate our birthdays. Visiting from Holland, Michigan. To celebrate my 21st birthday. Visiting, Visiting from Oklahoma City. College Station, Texas. Spokane, Washington. Knoxville, Virginia. And Rutland, Vermont. On Fall Break. In New York City. From Phoenix, Arizona. Hi to my mom in Galveston, Texas. We're on a road trip from Seattle for Harvey's first time in New York. Well, we are back 816 now with what's become one of our topics, oh, favorite yeah. topics here at the Today Oh my show. gosh, because we could just watch her all day. And her greatness first, of yeah, Simone Biles. Simone Biles in her first international competition in two years. She won five medals. Look at that. Four of them are gold, including the all-around title. Simone is now the most decorated gymnast, male or female, in history. It's amazing. NBC's Megan Fitzgerald joins us with the many highlights and what Simone had to say. Megan, good morning. Guys, good morning to you. Look, we may never see another athlete like Simone Biles again. She is just that good. And this weekend, her greatness was on full display. Simone Biles once again proving why she's the greatest of all time, leaving the world championships in Belgium with five medals got to be happy with what you did here. Yes, I'm very proud of the performances that I put out, that Team USA put out. I don't think we could have asked for anything more. The three-time world champion on the beam. Biles setting the tone on individual beam, winning gold with a flawless routine that included sticking the landing. She closed out the week with a phenomenal floor routine that once again put her high-flying skills on display executing a routine so challenging that even a slight misstep wasn't enough to keep her from grabbing gold. Also winning first place in the team competition and all around. So I'm proud that my coaches, that I have them pushing me each and every step of the way, as well as my teammates, because they're really what kept me going. Teammate Shilise Jones had a strong showing too, taking home bronze in the individual uneven bars on Saturday. Jones, a strong contender for the women's Olympic team, telling Savannah that's her goal. So, um, the world hasn't seen me yet, and I just feel like I'm going to keep pushing until I get to that final goal. A strong Team USA led by the mighty Simone Biles, who is well on her way to the Olympic Games, but says she's taking it a step at a time. Well, I still think there are so many more meets before that next year, so we're going to focus on those first and see how far we get. And guys, look, I can tell you it is going to be an exciting Olympics to watch. By the way, we're just 291 days from the start of the Olympics for the opening games. But who's counting? I'm, I'm clearly not counting, yeah. guys. She's on a roll, that's for sure. They all are. Who, who believes that Simone's not going to be in Paris? I mean, what is she's she got to say? I love that she's, she's pretending like there's a chance she won't be. <laughs> well, if she's able, I think she'll be there. She's for sure. sure. Yeah. Thank you, Megan. Because NBC will drag her first. Exactly. They will make sure.
let's talk about the NFL now and an impressive win for the 49ers on Sunday Night Football. Not him. Jumped up and made the sack. After Razzle Dazzle. Heard it. Coming out, Kittle. In empty space. Kittle, number two. Touchdown, San Francisco. Purdy to Kittle again. That was George Kittle's second TD of the night. He scored another one in the third quarter as San Francisco absolutely crushed those boys from Dallas 42 to 10. Well, you know who was in the stands for our Inside the Game series? Kaylee Harton. She joined a very unique group of fans, then flew across the country. <laughs> Even as I read it, I didn't believe it. I'm like, you were there, and now you're here. Good morning, Kaylee. Good morning. The you travel gods, fresh. it's a miracle. The yes. travel gods absolutely smiled on me. I can't believe it. But the fans that I got to hang out with last night, they live and breathe football. They feel every win and every loss and every big hit because they are the wives, fiancés, and girlfriends of the players on the field. So we wanted to find out, what is it like to be married to the NFL? Touchdown! That was awesome! Touchdown! Nice! The nerves hit different on game day when your fiancé is on the field. I have a really hard time sleeping. <laughs> I like can't sleep before games. How do you manage your game day emotions? I always pray first and foremost for safety, just a safe, clean game. Model and entrepreneur Olivia Culpa is no stranger to the spotlight, but Levi's Stadium is her future husband Christian McCaffrey's stage. McCaffrey to the goal line. She says the move from North Carolina to Northern California when McCaffrey got traded last season was made easier thanks to her new sisters on the sidelines. What role did the 49ers wives play in welcoming you into being a part of this family? They were so welcoming. I, I've been so lucky with all of the women here. Mindy's amazing. Mindy Armstead, wife of 49ers captain Eric Armstead, rarely misses a game, even when she has a busy work day on the other side. Sunday night, big yes. game, yes. and you're going to be in the office Monday morning. Oh, absolutely. On game day, she's Mrs. Armstead. They always have like in the AA like hidden somewhere. But at home, she's mom to Amiri and Ayla. And at work as a psychiatrist, she's Dr. Armstead. When you signed up for a life with an NFL player, did you know what you were getting yourself into? I had no idea. I think a lot of us don't. Who is the most superstitious on game day? I feel like I'm, I'm a little superstitious. <laughs> I, I was gonna say, I was gonna say Paloma for sure. Yeah. But I didn't want to call her off. Yeah, I mean, I think like, I eat McDonald's every single time. Before, before game day, that's like my, me and Trent's superstition. Together, the wives and girlfriends of the 49ers serve as the ultimate support system for one another. No one else can understand kind of that pressure, be kind of this emotional powerhouse and support system for your significant other. I think we really band together and you end up making super fast friends because of that. Eric has said that he couldn't do what he does without you. I second that, but <laughs> I've got to take the car for the oil change and I've got to do all the daycare tours and do the fun things, but also the not so fun things. Last year, you're having your second baby with a tiny one at home and Eric breaks his leg. How does that change the dynamic in this house? He can't do bath with one while I'm like feeding the other because he should be staying off his leg. And so it was so okay, so, difficult. Okay. Unfortunately, it's not the most glamorous side of, of the NFL, I would say. No, but it, it's the reality. Oh yeah, absolutely. On Sunday Night Football, the 49ers hosting their biggest game of the season to this point. There goes Christian on the run. And Olivia was there for it, even when she had to hold her breath. With every hit that you see Christian take, how does your body react to it? Well, I'm like waiting very patiently for the pig pile to lift and just like, okay, get, hurry up. Like, wait, there's, there's a lot of nerves for sure, but that's kind of why you just have to just like count your blessings every time there's a great game. Sunday was one of those nights for the families of the 49ers enjoying the win and each other. We have great girls and we're winning. There's nothing that could be better for me. 
For all the effort these women put into supporting the 49ers and each other, they also do so much good in their community. Mindy and Eric's Armstead Academic Project, which Mindy called their first baby, brings educational resources to underprivileged areas. And with Mindy's expertise, they're providing mental health resources, too. Guys, it was a very cool experience to see game day through their eyes and not yeah. to mention a 49ers win. Yeah. I was going to say, it's easy to be a 49ers fan this season. Too, yeah, right? it is. <laughs> so. pretty well. Go take a nap, Miss Kaylee. Thank you Thank so you, much. <laughs> All right, Carson's working on The Voice. That means you are pulling double duty. Yes, it is a double duty kind of day. So let's get to it and start with Bruce Springsteen this morning. Last month, the Grammy winner revealed he was undergoing treatment for peptic ulcer disease and postponed all concerts for the rest of the year. Well, now the boss is sharing his plans to return to the stage. Springsteen announcing the makeup dates for his U.S. concerts. He will start the tour up again in March 2024 with 10 dates running through the end of April. Springsteen will then head back back out on the road next August through September. So all tickets for postponed shows will remain valid for the new dates and rescheduled shows for his Canada concerts will be announced soon. So we are so glad to see the boss back on Absolutely. the men and back on the stage, right? Mm -hmm. All right, next up, the Foo Fighters. Over the weekend, the Rock and Roll Hall of Famers hit the stage at the annual Austin City Limits Music Festival and were joined by some pretty special company. None other than country superstar Shania Twain. After she finished her own headlining set, the Grammy winner ran across the festival and joined the band wow. for their 2005 hit, Best of You. Watch oh, this. Okay. <laughs> Fit right in there. Yes, she does. I mean, so Looks she's got country, pop. Now she can check off rock. And yeah. She's a redhead. What kind of love you into it? <laughs> I know. I loved it. All right, next up, Barbara Streisand. Who remembers the Grammy winner and Robert Redford starring together in the 1973 classic, The Way We Were? Wouldn't it be lovely if we were old? We'd have survived all this. And everything would be easy and uncomplicated the way it was when we were young. Katie, it was never uncomplicated. Well, that iconic pairing almost oh, didn't happen. In a new excerpt from Streisand's memoir published in Vanity Fair, the actress revealed Redford kept denying her request to take on the role of Hubble. She writes, Bob was concerned that the script was so focused on Katie that Hubble's character was underdeveloped. Uh -huh. I wanted Bob to be happy, so I told Sidney, give him anything he wants, but Bob's answer was still no. However, Barbara continues, one day I got a telegram that simply said, Barbara Redford. That's when I knew he'd finally said yes. The courtship had been tough, but Bob's reluctance had wow. a big influence on the script and ultimately resulted in a richer, more interesting character. That's cool. Mm. Streisand's memoir, My Name is Barbara, comes out next month. I love That's all the backstories. Yeah. Yeah. When you're calling Robert Redford Bob, Bob. You, you know it's <laughs> the inside scoop, right? All right, next up, Renee Rapp. The rising pop star has had a busy few months between releasing her debut album and, of course, taking over our plaza. Today, she's stopping by the Jennifer Hudson Show show and in a sneak peek clip renee and jay hud lend their powerhouse vocals to a destiny's child track take a listen mm. dangerous in love with you i never leave just keep loving me the way i love you loving me i love you i love you i love you love you love you Wow. You can just sit and sing that Right? Album. It's like just effortless. Like, I would I watch even, that show. Right? Just Jay Hud singing with Barry. You don't have to face. stand up. You're right. They're no. sitting. Yeah. Right? Sitting like this. Maybe we should try that at night. Let's just sit and sing. Oh, Harmonize. Yeah. Please don't do that. Please don't um, try that. So maybe. you could be like to Craig. I love you. I love you. Love. <laughs> You've got a nice voice, too. It's true. You, you can do it. You actually can't can sing. No. Exactly. Not anymore. Yeah. Anyway. <laughs> all right. Back to Bob Moving Bob. on. <laughs> <laughs> oh, this is a good this one. I saw this one. This one is good. Finally, Will Ferrell, the actor, is taking on a new role. DJ. <laughs> Over the weekend, this video going viral on TikTok oh, showing no. Ferrell spinning the turntables at a University of Southern California oh, frat party. Oh, my goodness. While this could be straight out of one of the comedian's movies, turns out 
Will's son, Magnus, is a student at Southern Cal, oh and his God. dad was there <laughs> celebrating Parents Week. Parents Week. Can you imagine that's your dad? It seems <laughs> just, so amazing. If, if only there was more cowbell. Uh. <laughs> And welcome back this morning on Your Health. Some important news from the American Heart Association. According to the latest research, one in three adults has three or more risk factors that contribute to cardiovascular disease, kidney disease, and or metabolic disorders. And the AHA is now defining it as a condition called CKM syndrome. And here to walk us through everything we need to know, NBC News medical contributor, Dr. Natalie Azar. Dr. Azar, always good to have you. I had not heard of this un until now. CKM, what is that? Yeah, so it is, it's important to remember that the conditions that make up CKM syndrome are not new. It stands okay. for cardiovascular disease, kidney disease, and metabolic diseases or syndromes. And what's encompassed, Craig, in the metabolic is stuff that we have known increases the risk for heart disease for years. We're talking type 2 diabetes, okay. obesity, things like that that fall under that sort of label. But what, what has happened here with the AHA in defining this syndrome is that they're really wanting to sort of reset the framework of how people think about cardiovascular disease risk, okay. prevention, and management. And they've done so, they've made it sort of easy for us because they've stratified CKM into four stages. So let's talk, zero about, to let's four. talk about these yeah. stages so we know what to be aware of, these four yeah. stages. So stage zero is where we hope to all be. That means you have no cardiovascular or kidney or metabolic risk factors. And in this group, Craig, what you're doing is all the lifestyle things diet, exercise, no smoking, all of that kind of stuff. In stage one, however, you might already have some excess fat or some excess fat, especially in the belly mm -hmm. area, or you might have prediabetes. We're also talking here about lifestyle interventions, losing 5% of your weight loss, for example. Now in stage two, we're starting to have those metabolic risk factors, high blood pressure, type two diabetes, maybe you have some kidney disease here. This is where, and this is why it's so important, this is where we can really intervene, and we want to start intervening with medications. For yeah. example, Ozempic, Wigovi, different medications to prevent progression of the kidney disease. And then stage three, we have asymptomatic heart disease. That means you've already have established heart disease. Maybe you're also on a statin. And then stage four, where you actually have symptomatic heart disease with or without kidney failure. It's a lot, and there's a lot in there, and I really want to reinforce to people listening yeah. and also to providers like myself, this is actually a, a sort of guidance and a framework that we can all look and say, mm, where do I fit along yeah. here? Where do my patients fit along here? 
The point is to not progress. The point is to regress. That if you're in stage three or two or one, you want to go backwards, not forwards. And I understand there's also this, this risk calculator now yes. that's also being unveiled and, as well. And this is the, a new component. So the old risk calculator was used to predict a 10-year probability of a heart attack or stroke in people between the ages of 40 and 75. Now the risk calculator is going to start for people at age 30. It's going to predict a 10-year and a 30-year probability for having either a heart attack, a stroke, or congestive heart failure. Whoa. And the best thing about the new calculator, Craig, is that it is going to incorporate these new kidney numbers, diabetes numbers, and also what we refer to as the social determinants of health, right? Because think about people who don't have access to a gym or wow. don't have access to good nutrition. And they really stress the collaboration amongst specialists and sort of this more coordinated care for people. So again, not, not a new disease, just a different way to think about cardiovascular disease in the syndrome of all these factors that actually interplay with one another. Dr. Azar, thank you. It was a lot. I just learned, I just learned a lot, too, <laughs> so thank you. Thank you very much. Back now, 849 with our series Money Saving Monday. Christmas, believe it or not, just 77 short days away. And this is a big week to start shopping, perhaps. Many retailers, including Amazon and Walmart, kicking off some major holiday sales. NBC's business reporter Brian Chung is here with some deals that you need to know about. Always good to have you. Thanks for coming back. Thanks. So where can shoppers start to find some of these, these big holiday deals? Yeah, which, by the way, I mean, this is a great way to get ahead of Christmas. So Google says that as of mid-October, 21% of people have already said they've done some holiday shopping. So people already? are getting already. Already. Wow. Like they're trying to get ahead of the curve. You, know, okay. you don't want to be too late. But uh, either way, that means that a lot of stores are trying to capitalize on getting people to the deals as early as possible. Kohl's, BJ's, and Walmart have already started their holiday deals effective today through the middle of this week. Amazon and Best Buy, these are the big deals that they're going to be unveiling as well. Those deals don't start until tomorrow, and they're going to be short. It yeah. won't be through the whole week. It's only going to be a few days. Uh, these are kind of flash shells that they're using to try to get people ahead of the curve. Is this something new, or, or does this happen every year? Uh, well, Amazon has interestingly gone about a new strategy. So uh, this is something that's been a little bit more recent lately. Okay. But again, they're trying to get Black Friday plus October sales as well. So let's talk about some of the gifts that we should go ahead and splurge on now, or perhaps some things that we should wait on until maybe Cyber yeah. Monday or Black Friday. Well, the natural question is, where are the best deals? And uh, we spoke with Trey Bodge, who's a, a retail shopping expert. And she was saying, home essentials, small appliances, and beauty products are the things you want to watch out for uh, for this week's deals. Home essentials, we're seeing things like pots and pans at Amazon, 50% off. Keurig coffee makers at Walmart, 55% off. Uh, dry shampoo for beauty products, uh, 30% off. And then I did want to highlight that tech, in some cases, could be a good deal as well. We were seeing some Apple Watches for 50% off. So if you know your loved one yeah. really wants an Apple Watch, it could be a good time to buy in there. And there, there's those things really go on sale. They do. They do really go on sale. And uh, it's a big, obviously, ticket item as and, well. And what about some things maybe we should wait to, to buy, some things that we yeah. should skip now? Well, Craig, I mentioned tech. So again, we did see watches on sale, but uh, it is 
it's usually the case that TVs and other types of laptops, for example, tend to have the steepest discounts on Black Friday. Yes. So if you can, maybe wait a few more weeks. Again, it's not long before we get to November. Uh, some toys also, you're really not going to get the best deals now. The best deals tend to be in December after Black Friday, which is very interesting. But Craig, as you know, with toys, if you wait until that long, they might not be on the shelf any longer. So if you see a toy that you know your kid wants, try to buy it uh, ahead and early. And then lastly, winter apparel. You don't see the discounts on winter apparel until the later part of the season because people are trying to bundle up now. They're yeah. willing to pay up a little bit more. So if you can, maybe wait until you uh, get into later parts of the okay. season. Well, let's talk about some of these, these prime day deals as well, right? Yeah. So in Amazon, the sales begin tomorrow. And here are some of the discounts that we were seeing. 25% off some laptops and monitors. If you wanted to get a new vacuum for the house as well, we were seeing 30% off some Dyson products. But there were some other things that I was seeing. Uh, you were getting Amazon essentials, for example, things you need just for the kitchen, 30% yeah. off. And then if you are a runner, uh, you can get some ASIC shoes for 55% off some models. Uh, again, those deals don't start until tomorrow, so it's a flash sale as well. It's only going to last through Wednesday, so you're going to have to move quick as well. And, and to be clear, this is Amazon Prime's big deal day. Big deal day. Different than Prime Day, Not which you see in Prime Day. Exactly, but it's all this. I mean, it's sales. Amazon's is big. <laughs> they just make it up stuff. Yeah, every week will be a Prime week, maybe at some it. point. <laughs> uh, thank you, Mr. Chung, as always. Uh, for more holiday sales and our Shop Today team's live blog on Amazon's Prime big deal days, Go to our website, today.com slash shop. Guys? All right, Craig, thank you so much. We're back outside. We've got such a huge crowd out here today. You want to help me celebrate some birthdays? All right, let's spin around those Smucker's jars and wish a very happy 100th birthday to Rita Kurtz of Woodbury, New York. She says the secret to longevity is having a sense of humor. And look at that smile. Maurice Rogers of San Jose, California is 100. He has lived in the same house for nearly 60 years. That's so cool. Get this, guys. We're wishing a happy 105th birthday to wow. Wilmer Cole of Farmington Hills, Michigan. She has traveled all across the country with her community church. Good for her. Gladys Burklow is from Providence, Kentucky. This grandma is 100, and look at that sweatshirt. It says it all. She'll be celebrating her big day with her granddaughter and two great-grandkids. Samuel Cooper is from Saratoga Springs, New York. This World War II veteran is 100 years old. He served as a first lieutenant and of course, we salute you for your service, sir. And happy 101st birthday to Beatrice Jessen, a writer from San Diego. She's written three books and is also a talented artist who sends her drawings to family and friends. I'd like to see one of those. I love that. All these beautiful birthdays. I know. We have time. Can we do a crowd moment really yes. quickly? Everybody come over here. We'd like to introduce you guys to Annie. How are you? Good. How are you? Tell everybody where you live. Carmel, Indiana. All right, and this is, it says, first week as school news anchor. Woo! <laughs> Do you have any tips for her, Savannah? Um, just be yourself. Okay. Your, yourself seems really cute. Thank <laughs> you. Can I what tell grade you something? Are you in? Fifth. Fifth grade. Fifth okay, grade. Okay, awesome. So when I was in fifth grade, we had a career day, and they told us to draw a picture of what we wanted to do. I drew myself as a news anchor. Wow. I put a little box by my head. So the time is now, my friend. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> what is it about being a news anchor that you love? It's fun just like presenting to everybody and ha have everybody watching you. Aww. Everybody, let's cheer for Annie. Yes, Annie. And everybody back at your. So nice. Nice to meet you, too. You're on oh your way. Goodness, cutie. I love it. Cutie. All right, guys, what's coming up on the third yeah, hour? On the third hour, math and English lesson all in one. We're going to explain some misunderstood financial terms to help you take control of your money. Where's Craig? I don't know where he went. I we guess we, he wants a serenade. <laughs> yes, yes exactly. he's waiting for that serenade. <laughs> guys, later on the fourth hour, a special performance from Grammy winner Colby Kelly. But first, nice. check your local news. And what you, you could say coming up next, the third hour. Coming up next, the third hour. Well done, Annie. But first, you'll open it. This morning on the third hour of today, full siege. Israel launches a massive counterstrike on Gaza overnight. In response to the surprise Hamas attack that killed hundreds of citizens. What we know about the situation on the ground. We're live in the region with the very latest. 
And then later in our series, Pink Power, a breast cancer survivor shares her important message about taking charge of your health and the remarkable help she's received from her biggest supporter. Plus, Gold Rush. Simone Biles dazzles at the World Gymnastics Championships, winning four gold medals. What she's now saying about the 2024 Paris Olympics. And start today. We're getting a glimpse at Chanel's marathon training, plus her running coach is here with some easy at-home exercises. That's all ahead today, Monday, October 9th, 2023. Live from Studio 1A in Rockefeller Plaza, this is the third hour of today. And a good Monday morning. Welcome to this third hour of today. Craig, Chanel, Dylan is here. Mr. Roker enjoying the holiday off. It is uh, an incredibly busy Monday. We're going to get right to it because we are closely monitoring that situation that mm -hmm. continues to unfold in the Middle East overnight. Israel launching what it calls an extensive attack on Hamas targets in Gaza. Uh, that, of course, in response to Hamas crossing the Gaza border into Israel, an outright invasion and a surprise attack over the weekend. One of the deadliest and most vicious onslaughts ever mm. on Israeli military and civilians. As of 9 a.m. on the East Coast here, more than 700 Israeli citizens are dead. More than 100 others are being held hostage. And at least 500 have been killed in the counter-strike in Gaza. And just this morning, a State Department spokesman said that nine Americans are among the victims. This as the U.S. Navy is now sending its largest aircraft carrier to the region. So we, of course, we have the story covered for you this morning from every angle. Our national security expert, Jeremy Bash, is here. But we begin with NBC's Kelly Kobiella, who is live in Tel Aviv. Kelly, what's the latest? Yeah, I think, guys, people are really in a state of shock still here in Israel. It's interesting uh, being on the streets in Tel Aviv. They're empty of traffic. A lot of shops are closed. Uh, and the situation on the ground here is changing by the hour. Earlier today, we heard air raid sirens a couple of times over the span of about an hour and a half, two hours. We heard the dull thud of explosions. At least three rockets fell in three different cities uh, in southern Israel today, even as the Israeli Defense Forces carried out that operation in Gaza. The Israeli uh, military is now warning people in the north to stay inside, to shelter in place, because what they said was a possible incursion on that border. Meantime, family and friends are just desperately trying to find information on their missing loved ones. You mentioned the number of dead. There's an unknown uh, number of missing. Many of these people were at a music festival in the desert uh, Saturday morning when this assault started. 260 people at that festival have been confirmed killed. Their bodies were recovered yesterday. Soldiers and civilians, both among those who've been kidnapped and taken across the border. And again, you mentioned the heavy toll in Gaza as well with civilians among the dead. Guys. All right, Kelly Kobier for us there in, in, uh, in Tel Aviv. Kelly, stay safe. Let's bring in Jeremy Bash, former chief of staff in the CIA, also uh, former chief of staff at the Pentagon uh, for the Department of Defense. Good to have you back. Thank you, All sir, right. as always, for your insight. Uh, this was a, 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 a multifaceted attack. I mean, we're talking about folks who were like, hang gliding in, came land, air, sea. How elaborate was this, and what do we suspect the Israeli response is going to be? Yeah, a thousand fighters blowing through a protected security fence. They used drones to take out the cameras, sensors. They were practicing this operation for months, maybe even as much as a year. Mm -hmm. I think the Israeli military saw this as potentially just another exercise, just another show of force by Hamas. But they succeeded this time. They blew the fence and infiltrated Israel and went house to house, village to village, and killed so many innocent civilians, engaged the IDF, and took hostages. This is an unprecedented military assault by a terrorist military. You know, there have been so many theories as to how this may have happened or the chess game behind all of this. Can you talk to me about what role Iran may have played and the planning and the implications for that, if it is indeed true. Yeah, for many years, Chanel, Iran has been funding Hamas. They've been training Hamas. They've been providing capability to Hamas, including rocket, artillery and mortar. Whenever rocket fire goes off and Israelis are going into bomb shelters, those are Iranian made rockets that are flying in the skies. So Iran is behind this. And I think the big question is, how far will the Bibi Netanyahu government feel they need to go to strike Iranian targets in the region? Because, of course, 
that could spark a much wider yeah. regional war. Mm. We know nine Americans have been killed. A lot of Americans live over in Israel. Yeah. Do we know the status of, of so many of them? It's unknown at this hour. I mean, the thing about Israel is it's a small country. So everybody knows everybody who's been affected by this crisis. I spoke to people in Israel this morning. They were telling me about a half a dozen families that lost loved ones. It's a country of nine million people. When you sort of think about it in the context of 700 people dying from our perspective in America, it would be like, 20,000 Americans getting killed. We would all know somebody who's been affected by this tragedy. Really quickly, Jeremy, it's some, a fair amount has been made about this already, but I think it's a point that we should delve into once again. Typically, historically, the Israelis, they've been sort of the gold standard when it comes to intelligence. Mm. What happened here? I don't think we know yet. I mean, this was a comprehensive breakdown of not just intelligence, but also border security and civil defense. And I think there are going to be a lot of uh, recriminations, but also probably a lot of sobering analysis about how Israel's going to have to change the security paradigm. But I will tell you one thing. I don't think the Israeli government will allow Hamas to continue to exist in Gaza. For the last two decades, they've exchanged fire they go quiet for a little while. I think this is it. This is I it. think Israel is going to have to decimate, degrade, and destroy Hamas mm. in Gaza. All right. Jeremy Bash. Thank you. Thanks Thank you, so Jeremy. Much. Thank you. Okay, we're going to take a turn now to some other headlines on what we said was a busy Monday morning. A lot of you may have stepped out the door to notice a big change. After some record high temperatures last week, cold air has certainly come rushing in. Uh, take a look at where we are starting off the day. We began down in the low 30s and 40s. We had some frost advisories, some freeze warnings, and high temperatures today. Up into Marquette, Michigan, only 42 degrees. 50s back through Detroit into Chicago. It is below average. It's a little bit too soon for this to be happening. Um, but it's settling into the Northeast, too. You can certainly feel that chill out. There. Fall Chilly is upon us. Yes, yeah, here. Oh, All right. Uh, now to a number that's got a lot of folks talking. 1.5 billion. Mm -hmm. That's the number because that is what's at stake in tonight's Powerball drawing. No one matched the numbers over the weekend. That is why this studio is still full of people. <laughs> uh, the jackpot, it's rising up the list now, too. It is now the third largest Powerball jackpot of all time. And it keeps coming, because now yeah. today is my day. I'm like, oh, I'm just showing off. I know, it's like 20, 20. Yeah, it's, 20. I'm just showing out 20s, and you're not winning. Did you, you winning. cover the tab? Uh, mine is today. Okay, yes. all right. She hasn't said she did it. Well, because I Venmo. Oh, you did for the commercial. Gerard, did she Venmo? I'm going to Venmo. He gives me his little thing that you can scan. Okay. Do you know what yeah. I'm talking just about? make it sure, because if we miss out on Powerball, <laughs> yeah. and it's your Can fault. you imagine <laughs> when it was my day? Right. All right, well, turning now to lucky number six for Simone Biles. She won her sixth all-around title this weekend at the Gymnastics World Championships in Belgium. Biles took home five medals, including four golds, and that's after her nearly two-year break from the sport. So here to break down her latest impressive feat, Simone's former teammate, NBC Sports Gymnastics analyst, and two-time Olympic medalist herself, Lori Hernandez. Good morning Hello. to you. Good morning. It's, so, it's interesting. Morning. This weekend, you know, Simone Biles is all over my feed, right? And it was funny <laughs> to see the, the shots of, like, when she won it, like, a gazillion years ago, and then now. First of all, she looks the same. She looks the same, except for she looks the same, and she just keeps getting better. <laughs> Talk about the level of skill. I mean, we know she's yeah. good, but you really understand it. Oh, yeah. Honestly, for Simone, it's like she didn't even take a break. She I mean, walked in there, she said, let's go. Time off what? <laughs> uh, no, she came Look in here and just absolutely dominated on these events. When it comes to all-around finals, there was a hiccup on floor where she had tripped, and there was a missed leap, so that was definitely a bit of a deduction. However, she still won all-around finals, right. so that she doesn't matter. She looks like she's <laughs> yeah. Seriously. Like, yeah, and I think there's a lot of control. I've mentioned this before, but a lot of groundedness that we've seen, not only in her performance, but in herself. Uh, so that's that's a really fun watch. I Let's talk it. about the vault now, because she's still got silver, yeah. but there was a little bit of a hiccup. She was doing the Biles 2, which we know is a very, very hard maneuver. Yeah. Um, and she still comes away with silver. But what was the, what do you think was the reason Ooh. to try this? Yeah, so in terms of this event, um, when it comes to vault finals, we, er, Athletes have to do two vaults from different families. So that means you enter the table from two different ways. For her, that's the Biles 2 and the Cheng Vault. And in terms of the Biles 2 that we're seeing here, she had so much power. Yes, you can see that. <laughs> she had so much power that she had fallen out of it. But the difficulty difficulty level is so high mm -hmm. that she still won a silver. Right. Yeah, right. Because no is, one else can do it. That, <laughs> yeah. That's unheard of. You almost, <laughs> yeah. you almost have to wonder if, if her taking a break from the sport 
is part of the reason that she is coming back in such a dominant fashion. I, it, mm. I, I don't know. Possibly. I mean, her reasons for coming back, those are something that we're in interviews. She's mentioned that this is for her. Yeah. Mm. She's not going to really let us know why she's doing it. She knows why she's doing it. That's all that matters. It's up to us to get all the analytics and yeah. kind of speculate. Yeah. But for her, she's out there just for herself and enjoying her time. And I love that. Charlize Jones also, I mean, quite, quite yeah. impressive. What's it going to take to, to see Charlize on the podium in Paris? Yeah. So in terms, again, of all around finals, Charlize Jones won a bronze for Team USA, which is brilliant, exciting. But for Paris, the best thing that she can do to level up is to raise that difficulty score. She hit a lot of really nice routines. But, you know, in terms of her best event here on the uneven bars, she had also won a bronze. Again, so exciting for uneven bar finals. But she nailed that routine. So to up that difficulty, that's what's really going to stick I love it. that. Last week, we had a chance to, um, we introduced everybody to the U.S. men's um, team, some of the contenders there. Fred Rod or Richards, Fred Rogers. Fred Richards won with the bronze in the men's all around. Um, Coy Young added two individual silver medals. I feel like we all wanted to kind of wrap around our arms around these um, young boys. Yeah. They have a lot of potential, too. Yeah, I mean, what's great about this is that Team USA for men's artistic gymnastics has not been on the podium in about nine or so years. Is that long? Yeah, team. so to see Team USA men's gymnastics get out there and win that bronze for team finals, oh this is an exciting wow. feat. We're seeing this for women's artistic, where yeah. countries internationally are rising to the happen. occasion, and for men's artistic, hard. they sure are doing that for themselves, yeah. and Good. it has to be acknowledged. So I'm really excited. Yeah. I'm proud of them. They're doing the thing. I love it. All right, Lori, thank you thank so you, much. Lord. Cheers. Thanks for having me. That was good. All right, just to add here on a Monday morning, we're going to help you take control of your money, breaking down misunderstood financial terms that you really need to know. And then later in our series, Pink Power, one breast cancer survivor's important message about taking control of your health. Third hour of today, right back after this. Mm. This morning, we're launching a new series here on the third hour of today. It's called Know Your Words. I so, mom used to tell me that when I was little. No, you say your, yes. Use words. Know your words. <laughs> so we're going to help you take control of your money by breaking down some personal finance terms that are frequently used but often misunderstood. And here to do that, NBC News business and data reporter, Brian Chung. We like this. Know your words. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I brought, by the way, the tweed, you know, the professor look. I, I like was that. trying to go it for it. Yeah, that I was like the idea. That. That professor Chung. So let's start with inflation and recession because we use those words a lot. I don't know if everyone knows what they mean, but how are they related? How are they connected? Yeah, well, for the last year and a half, we've been hearing inflation, inflation, inflation. Well, inflation is a noun and it refers to the rate at which prices change. So usually going upwards, right? If it was the opposite direction, it'd be called deflation. Uh, and a lot of people have been experiencing this at the store, right? The pace of price increases has been so dramatic at the grocery store, at everywhere else. Constantly. Exactly. Uh, but it doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to lead us into a recession. And a recession is defined as a period of economic downturn, which could be, it has been in some cases, triggered by inflation, but it could also be the result of a number of other things. Think about the financial crisis, right? That wasn't inflation in of, it, of itself. There's it a few banks blowing up. So there's just a many, there's many different ways that a recession could happen, but broadly speaking, it just refers to a time when economic activity in the country slows down. How many consecutive quarters for a recession? Two. Uh, but it's important to note the National Bureau of Economic Research is the one that determines whether or not we're in a recession. They haven't said we're in one right now, but they're the kind of ultimate authority on deciding. All right, Professor. Chapter number two, <laughs> yep. we're going to deal with assets and debt. Yeah, so these are also big buzzy words, too. And, you know, if you have a personal uh, finance advisor, these are things you've probably talked about as well. Assets are anything that you own of economic value. So think about your home, your car, 
other things like that. It could be things you have in your house, your couch, your jewelry. Um, debt, though, on the other hand, is anything that you owe. So if you have a personal loan, a mortgage, a car loan, those are things that obviously you owe to the bank or you owe to somebody else. So when we talk about net worth, how much are you worth? How much is your household worth? It's basically taking your debt and subtracting it from your assets. Yeah. So that's what those mean. So like calories in, calories out. Exactly, yeah. exactly. Perfect way of thinking about it. Um, okay, so we know that now. Let's talk about interest. And interest can kind of go in your favor or... Not. Yeah, well, I mean, that's relevant for debt, right? So right. when we talk about interest, we often think about, okay, well, how much do you owe when you take a mortgage out? Right now, rates are mm -hmm. 7%. Uh, but we also have to remember, interest works in your favor as well. If you're putting money into the bank, you collect interest. But mm -hmm. what's really important to remember about interest is that it compounds, right? You have more money in the bank, you're collecting interest, and then interest compounds on that. Okay. But it works the same way with debt as well. So if you're borrowing money on a credit card, for example, well, that debt accumulates. If you don't make your payments, you get interest deducted for, or you have interest added to that. And that adds up over time. So something really important to remember. You've got some yeah. great interest rates right now and some savings accounts out yes, there too. Yes, but not on your loans because mortgage exactly. rates are mm -hmm. like that. Yeah. Uh, really quickly, before you go, stocks and bonds. I think most people know what a, a stock is and they know what an equity is, but the difference between stocks and bonds. Yeah, well, as a reminder, I mean, stocks are things that you can have a portfolio with. You can trade on a certain company. I like this company. I want to buy the stock. So again, it's shares of a company and you can have a stake in that company. You get dividends in some cases by investing in it through a brokerage, for example, which you can do even on your phone these days. Mm -hmm. uh, bonds are another way that you can invest as well. Some people, you, you know, you might be aware of U.S. bonds you can buy in the government. Uh, you can also get bonds from a company as well. Uh, that is structured a little bit differently. Basically, you'll give a loan to the company or when you buy a U.S. bond, you're basically giving a loan to the government, and then they'll give you interest back that collects over a certain duration of time. So a bond would be, let's say, a year or two years or five years. And then over the duration of that bond, you end up getting uh, some coupon Makes payments, which is nice. That. Exactly. Great huh. segment, Thank Brian. Thank you, Professor Chung. Yes, like yes, know your so words. Hmm. All right, coming up just ahead, our series Pink Power. We are going to meet a breast cancer survivor who is making a personal milestone by sharing an important message. We'll be right back. Our Pink Power series, and you're about to meet a New York State social worker who says advocating for herself saved her life. Two years ago, Ladrea Macon saw a PSA reminding her to conduct a breast self exam, and when she did, she felt something was wrong. Ladrea pushed to get a mammogram, then doctors discovered two lumps, eventually diagnosing her with stage two breast cancer at the age of 34. Mm, 34 years old, after undergoing 16 rounds of chemo and surgery, she is now marking one year of being breast cancer free hey. this month. We are so happy to have Ladrea here with us this morning with her twin sister, Ladrima, and Ladre Ladrea's oncologist, Dr. Douglas Mark from NYU Langone Health. Good morning to all of you. Good, Good morning. morning. So happy you're here, Ladrea. Let's start with you. You discovered something wasn't right during your self-exam. When you went to your doctor, when you first started this process where people saying, oh, but you're so young. I mean, did they push you or did you have to push for yourself? No, I had to advocate. I you went did. and I'm 34, no health problems. I said, something's wrong. She said, come back in two weeks. Mm. I'm like, I need a mammogram. So after two weeks, I went back and she's like, okay, you know, you're persistent. So I went and I advocated and they gave me a mammogram. Mm. So two months later. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. 
Latrina, you, you you guys are sisters. Yeah. I'm a, and and everyone knows if something happens with one sister, you know, you just start being concerned for yourself. Absolutely. So, what were you concerned about after this diagnosis? Um, I panicked. Uh, I'm a single mother, so I'm like, she has breast cancer. What if I have breast cancer? We both can't, you know, be going through this battle together. Oh. Um, I got hypervigilant. I ran to my doctors mm. and yeah, started asking questions. And, you know, she, they told her originally she couldn't have the mammogram because yeah. of her age. But as soon as I said my sister, they were like, whoa. Yeah. They pushed me in and I started doing all of the preventative, preventative mm. care to make sure I didn't have it. Yeah. Dr. Moore, let's, let's talk about that because, again, I mean, she's healthy. She's in her 30s. Mm -hmm. As I understand, at least, not, not a family history at that point. Mm -hmm. How common is this for someone who doesn't have a family history to be diagnosed with, with stage 2 breast cancer in their 30s? Sure. So I think, you know, first thing is very important is that breast cancer is common. And uh, while the majority of women are diagnosed in their 50s and 60s, 20% uh, of women will be diagnosed uh, younger than 50, mm -hmm. and 5% of women will be diagnosed under 40. Mm -hmm. And while that might not sound like a lot, if you have 300,000 cases of breast cancer in the United States a year about, that's about 15,000 women wow. under 40. Mm -hmm. So it's very important if you feel something, like Ladrea did, you, you say something. Mm -hmm. and, and even when your doctor, best I can gather, the doctor was like, I don't know, but you're doing fine, come on back, we'll give you one, just to sort of appease you. Yeah. Good for you for advocating for yourself. Thank God for breast cancer awareness. I saw a PSA and said, check That's your amazing. breast. Yeah. I went home and I checked and I found something. I was shocked. Which is why we do segments like this. Mm -hmm. Listen, I talked about, I said at the top of this, 16 rounds of chemo. How did you do it? And I've heard that you stayed so positive. Oh, gosh, it was hard. I think being a mental health provider, I, I said to myself, this is not going to break you. There's going to be things that you're going to go through, but you got to make it through, girl. Like, mm -hmm. I was like my own coach. Um, what helps? A lot of us are, have, have friends who are dealing with it or families who are dealing with it. W what, what helped you? In what um, I would say, one, have your, your family and friends. Like, thank God for my family and friends. My sorority sisters, Pi Delta, I love you guys. They helped me. They were there at every chemo session. Your family, your friends. And just, you know, if you have, like, someone you pray to, something, like, I was just very big on, like, being healthy. Like, help, mental health. Just, yeah. I went to groups. Um, yes. I met so many different people. Um, just talking about it. Community. 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 Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and Dr. Marks, I mean... She was in a situation where she needed to advocate for herself and push for that mammogram. But the, the whole world of healthcare, it can be intimidating. You know, how, how do you know and how do you push when, when you need to? Well, I think, like Ladrea did, if you feel something that's not natural, that doesn't feel like your norm, you should bring it to your doctor's attention. Uh, these guidelines are for screening these, the, these age cutoffs, but if a, a patient has a symptom, it's diagnostic and it should be worked up. Mm. And also it should include a multidisciplinary team of doctors who you feel comfortable with. Ladrea had an excellent breast surgeon, John Logman, who would be here if I wasn't here today. Mm. Her radiation oncologist, John Haas, would also sit with her. Uh, today on this couch if I wasn't here. And, you know, all these team members should work with LaDrea and her clinical circumstances to figure out the right treatment. LaDrea, after, after seeing your sister go through this up close, what have you, what have you learned about her? She's a warrior. Mm -hmm. She's a breast cancer warrior. You know, we hear the term survivor. Um, the battle is not won yet because mm -hmm. she's not out the clear yet. Mm -hmm. um, she's one year breast cancer free. One she year. has uh, a few more to go before we can definitely say she's breast cancer free. So um, the battle still continues. She's a warrior and, you know, you. and she's resilient. She's resilient because this person was so positive, so positive during this whole experience. Thank you, sister. <laughs> <laughs> well, the two of you, I mean, my goodness, how lucky you are to have each other. Yeah. Thank you for sharing your story. Thank you. And hopefully Thank you. someone watching will say, you know what, maybe I should go do yep. self -exam. Yes, check yourself. Check your breast. Check your breast. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you, Dr. Marks, as right. well. All right, coming up next, our series, The Upside, the social club that's bringing new life to an old game and even getting some celebrity attention. We'll be right back.
this morning in our series, The Upside, a fast-growing social club where young people gather to play a game that's been around for, you know, about 200 years. NBC <laughs> News Now anchor Joe Fryer got a crash course in Mahjong. Yeah, and they are pretty good teachers, I'll tell you that. Ooh. So the four founding members of the Green Tile Social Club all went to the University of Texas in Austin, but they didn't meet until they all moved here to New York and started playing Mahjong. And what started with four people has now grown into a club that's welcomed nearly 4,000. It's a game that connects players to their culture and to each other. Mahjong, which was the backdrop for a pivotal scene in the movie Crazy Rich Asians. These days, the green tile is in style. Mahjong is having a bit of a renaissance. Honestly, I think it's because at its core, Mahjong is a very simple game and a very social game, and it's just the ultimate connector. It's why Joe Shu, Ernie Chan, Sarah Tang, and Grace Liu created the Green Tile Social Club, which didn't start as a club. It started with a simple Instagram story. Hungry to play Mahjong, who's down to learn? At first, four of them gathered for a weekly game night. And that slowly just like grew and grew. Like we posted on our stories and people were like, wait, I wanna learn how to play, or I've been like looking for this. Before you knew it, they had an Instagram account, then a logo, then a name, all promoting their meetups. What does that say, the fact that it's grown so quickly? It says that Mahjong is back. <laughs> I think it speaks a lot to young Asian Americans like us, looking for that community and looking to connect back to our roots and culture. Many grew up watching their parents and grandparents play, and it was serious business. And one day, I finally got the approval to have my own seat <laughs> at the table. You have to get approval? Once they think you know what you're doing, you're like, okay, you can have your own seat. <laughs> Of course, that's not everyone's experience. I didn't learn until recently. For a lot of my life, like, I was always too intimidated. And then it wasn't until I came to New York and I met all of us together, like, they taught me how to play. Grace is far from alone. That's why the club focuses on teaching newcomers. I'm new. Am I going to be OK? You're going to be just yeah. fine. Even teaching teach me. The name of the game in Mahjong is to create a winning hand. I was joined by a couple fellow novices. Have you been dying to play? I've been dying to play. I'm so excited for this. We listened intently as Joe showed us how the game bears some resemblance to poker. Instead of a deck of cards, you've got a wall of tiles. After a quick lesson. 90,000. East. Hold. Nice. <laughs> we were playing. Whiteboard. Fortune. Six of high. I pump. Yes. <laughs> Woohoo. And catching on. Uh, north. Making it accessible at all levels is key to attracting so many players. A lot of people come in and they meet people. By the end of meetup, they're all exchanging numbers, social handles, and then we end up seeing them all like hanging out outside of our events as well. Word travels so fast, it recently reached a surprising name. SNL's Bowen Yang showed up. Yeah. What? Did, did that blow your yeah. mind? <laughs> the craziest <laughs> moment ever. And he showed up on time, right at the start, stayed through the entire event, played with us. What did that tell you? We're a big deal, I guess. <laughs> so big, Ember Lowe brought her mom, who was visiting from China. How much is mom helping you here today? Uh, we've only won one so far. <laughs> Actually, out of like five games. <laughs> Still, that family connection is important. Just ask Lenny on. For me, it's a way to connect with my grandma because she has Alzheimer's and she says it helps keeps her wits a lot. So when we're doing it, when we're playing, it kind of really helps keeps her mind sharp. That must mean a lot to you. Yeah, it's it's a wonderful thing. These green clad tiles are not building walls, they're tearing them down. In doing so, keeping hundreds of years of tradition alive too, you know, and making sure that we can pass it down to the next generation just like our parents and our grandparents did and keeping it alive. The club generally holds one big meetup each month with some smaller events for more experienced players in other times. The founders say they want to keep growing and actually turn the club into a small business. They're trying to raise funds so they can hold even more events in more places all around New York. I love that. I have that. so many questions. I'm like, so wait, where do you draw from and what's the goal here? And I, I love playing games. I think this I think if you like thing. playing games and you will like this because there are just so many little intricacies you have to learn. Yeah. You do have to have four people to play a game. It's okay. not something where you're like, oh, I have two. It's fine. Right. You got to have four people. 
you would be like really good at it, Dylan. It, I say it's like Rummy Cube. I like Rummy Cube, and to me, yeah, me knowing too. Rummy Cube made it much easier to learn this, or Rummy, and then also a little poker in there, too. Okay. You, you know? picked it up pretty quickly. I picked yeah. it up. I tried to teach myself the day before at home, which was <laughs> hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> it did not go to one of the They'll, they'll teach you properly. Exactly. That was yeah. great. Thank, Thank you. you. Joe. Something you new. Uh, just ahead, a Halloween treat. The breakout star of the scary season right here in Studio 1A. By the way, that thing was hard to get. We're going to tell you about Lewis, the jack-o'-lantern craze. That's coming up in this is today. And then later, don't be scared of jumping into a running routine. Woo-hoo! Chanel's running coach is back. She's going to share some, some strengthening exercises as our girl it. gets ready to run that marathon. She's the one in the white shirt. That's Jess. Third hour of today, right back after this. <laughs> what are we doing? <laughs> with another edition of This Is Today. This is where we highlight some of the top stories on today.com, and you can read them as well and weigh in by scanning that QR code that's just below Dylan right there on your screen. Uh, here to tell us a little bit more today, Digital Editorial Director, Ariana Davis. Good to have you back. Good morning. Oh. I feel like you make us hip. So, <laughs> so let's, keep you young. Let's, let's start with this, this special guest here in the studio because I've actually heard about Lewis, and I'm not hip or cool. <laughs> but I, I know that Lewis is all the rage. He sold out. I have to correct you because in the commercial break you caught him a jack-o'-lantern. He's not a jack-o'-lantern. But he's not a jack-o'-lantern. His name is Lewis. (laughs) That is our special guest of the day. The internet is going wild over this eight-foot tall like Halloween decoration from Target. And basically he's just like a TikTok icon right now because he very adamantly when you press his button says like I'm... What did he say? You couldn't carve out some time to come out tonight. <laughs> it's creepy as all get out. He laughs. And the, like, his go-to viral line right now is he says, I am not a jack-o'-lantern. My name is Lewis. So, press him again. Press him again. Tis a night for all to play, for ghouls and goblins to dance away. I love that. Well, we, are, we are trying to get to the bottom of like who is Lewis, who's the real Lewis, why is his name Lewis? Lewis? But he has fan art made about him. He's got merch already. Like he is everywhere. Hard to get. But he's sold out everywhere. So we are very lucky That's that Lewis amazing. is wow. here in the studio with us. I love that. Well, you can take him home. All right. Well, <laughs> speaking of another social media trend, what seems to be, I guess, all over people's feeds is cowboy candy. Cowboy what is that? candy is um, so if you're from Texas, apparently, you might be familiar with this already, but it's essentially like a sugared sliced jalapeno. So it's like spicy. It's spicy and sweet. And basically you make it by you can get the full recipe at today.com. But you basically put three parts sugar, one part water, you simmer jalapenos for 30 seconds. And apparently this just like goes on everything from cream cheese to pizza to cookies. I'm going to let you guys try this, uh, the sweet and salty snack. But everyone. Now what's your jalapeno? I can't remember jalapeno business. I can't remember the jalapeno. You just eat it all like it. Yeah, you just eat, eat it as like a little snack. And it's sweet and salty, and it's Ooh. like taking over TikTok right good. now. The internet, I need so, to review. the internet is so stupid. Like, <laughs> <laughs> it's delicious. 
Oh, I like that. The internet is so stupid. That's the headline right there. Well, one more thing. Is it actually good? Is that the question? No, it's good. Good. What's that? We say yes. Craig's not a fan, but everyone, no, just, but mm. Dylan and Chanel are into it. People oh, do it too much. <laughs> All right. <laughs> but apparently you can just have it as a snack on cream cheese and it's delicious. So good. So good. All right. Okay. So, well, I know usually in today we cover all things digital. Yes. But a lot of people are raving about this interview that's coming up with Jay Hud. Jennifer Hudson and Renee Rapp were on her show recently, and they were just casually singing in their chairs, singing Dangerously in Love by Beyonce, yeah. and the vocals were super on point. <laughs> so everyone is loving this moment, but I'm curious if you guys, because you're just sitting here maybe in your chairs, are interested in singing a little a, a little vocals oh, to kind yes. of compete with, with <laughs> what, what, what do we what, think? Can we hear it? Chanel, sure, no, you've got a good singing No, let's listen. Like, crank it up for a second. Dangerously. Uh oh. See, the difference is she can sing. I feel like Craig can, can, can kind of give her one. I can't. I cannot. I kind of feel like I should be the girl that give Jay had shared. You were and Dylan, that's I'm you. Sorry. Yes, I'm that's wise. me because I'm blonde. So yeah, and so we'll put you in the middle. What song we will we sing? You love, you love. What, what, what song will we sing? We're singing that song. No, no, we can't sing that song. <laughs> Give us another song. Give us something easier. Not, he said, not know. Beyonce. Oh, we're out of time. We like that girl. Ariana, thank you. Thanks for having me. Thank, thank you, you for bringing us all the weird stuff. Oh, yeah. uh, for more, it's today.com. Also, sign up for our This Is Today newsletter. You can get more weird stuff as well uh, by scanning that QR code that's right under Dylan. You'll get the latest news in your email every morning. You're still eating it, so clearly you No, I took the jalapenos really like off. It. It's good. All right, when we oh, come cool. back, it is start today. We are going to run through some of the exercises I've been doing to prepare for the New York City Marathon and things you can do at home. Have you been really doing that? I actually have. Okay. We'll be right back. Especially that one. Bye. With start today for the past few months I've been training hard for the New York City Marathon which includes exercises for mobility and strength and this morning we get ooh, we do we get to try some <laughs> yeah. of these joining us is Nike running coach and Chanel's marathon coach isn't she amazing yes, she is. Just is amazing just is amazing. Yes. <laughs> amazing for putting up with Chanel as she like goes through All this process so yes. how, how is Chanel doing when it comes to no, training for marathon? No, Chanel has been doing great I would say <laughs> thank you I was most impressed with that eight 18 mile long run in the rain was nuts. first time 18 miles first time running with a group Very and true. ended up running probably two minutes faster per mile than you usually what? do on your own yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh. super <laughs> impressive yeah We're so proud of you and Thank now we got to repeat it this weekend for a little bit longer for 20 miles oh. yeah, oh, you can yeah. do a big 20 miler this weekend yeah. the longest long run yeah. so just you you did something it's called a gate analysis I yes. believe right for folks who aren't familiar, like what, what is this gait analysis and what did we learn from it? So a gait analysis is basically an analysis of your running form. Mm -hmm. So we had Chanel run on a treadmill at Finish Line Physical Therapy, and there's iPads with cameras recording her from her ankles to knees, hips, shoulders, head, just from top to bottom. And then it spits out all this information about her running form that her physical therapist, Sammy, was able to look at. And then you can, you know what yeah. it is? I feel like when you're little, you just start running. Nobody ever shows you how to run, right? Yeah, and so I, I think for anybody at home, it's 
not that expensive where you can just say, you know what, before I go out and hurt myself, let me go find out if maybe if there's something I can do to improve my running. You, you know what I mean? Well? I'm even taking my son right. today. Yeah. He plays soccer, and we've noticed with his gait, it's a little off. So I'm going right back there and taking my 14-year-old. I mean, it's a good thing to, to have. Well, yeah, that's great. And I think it showed you some things that you weren't expecting. Very true. Yeah. Very true. She thought she was going to have to work on her hip mobility, but it turns out we need to work on the ankle mobility, some forward lean, and things. then some quick cadence Yeah, stuff. so let's show them one of the exercises that we do for that. Oh, yeah, but we, we have some friends that can do help we? today. Okay, there we go. Yes. Hi, friends. <laughs> Hi, Come on in. Hello. Yes. <laughs> okay. So you can show, I guess there are three moves for us? Yeah, so okay. we're gonna start with the one that you did for your forward lean and okay. quick cadence. Yep. And so you're actually gonna team up with Pia here. She's Hi. gonna be oh, your little right. demo. Oh, that's right, we did have a partner. Okay. Yes, and then you two together, okay. you two together. So that. normally this would be done against a wall, a pole, or whatever. Okay. But if you wanna lean into I can't remember what Pia. I do. So lean straight oh, into the shoulders. wall. Is straight this into the, the shoulder wall. thing? Is this the this thing? Yes, the this thing. Okay. So this is a forward <laughs> lean with well, quick cadence. Around. So I bring one leg up, okay. bring one leg Opening. up as if you're about like to run. Yes. yes, and then as soon as it touches the ground, you want to pop back up really quickly. Like really quick. So forward lean with a quick cadence. So wait, wait, wait. Just one leg at a time. So we've got one. Okay. Hey, look, look, look. Watch Chanel. Yes. Oh. Yes. You're perfect. <laughs> so we're working on that. Next time, maybe you wear more appropriate dress for work. <laughs> yes. And then that quick cadence. So as soon as that you know foot is touching when you're the running, ground, you remember to like pick up. It's like the floor is lava. Like yes, it helps the floor is lava. It's a floor game. As soon as that right, foot touches one? the ground, we want to pop yeah, up. So this one, just the next one is for your hips. You don't need a partner. Oh. Uh, I know, but for <laughs> So for opening up your hips, especially if you're sitting at work all day oh, and then going to run. Yeah. So this one we like to call table toppers. So bringing one leg up and then you're grabbing your shin and your ankle as if you're placing it on top of a table and a gentle tug and release. Yes. Right yeah. <laughs> so opens right that's up. A good one. So that's a good one to do before every run. And then the last one, pogo hops, super simple, legs shoulder width apart. And then again, with that quick, quick feet. Go ahead and let the <laughs> heels touch the ground. Yes. Okay. Why, oh, wait. Do you, okay. why do you have to make that face quick, with me? I don't know. We want wait, quick, wait. like the ground no, is lava. Ground is lava. Quick, quick. Okay, wait, one more. This is <laughs> like talking about some of her, the marathon snacks she's oh, had to, yes. you know, nosh on during so, the miles. Yes. So we have some nutrition Come. here. Go ahead. Come. Talk about the importance of nutrition. There was one time where I did 14 miles. Yes. And the next day I was telling everybody and telling you and Yosef especially how it was hurting. And they're like, how's your nutrition? And then I realized this actually makes a difference if along your workout. I know, I heard the first time you tried it, it was if you were a toddler trying mushy peas for the first time. <laughs> yeah. so, but Just thank you. Sure. We're out of time. Thank you, Jess. You want me to try one of these? Try one of these. Slash start Super today from to Great Inspiration. We'll be right back. Third hour of today. All right. <laughs> Tomorrow, Reba McIntyre's here. Let's think about a Lewis. Bye, Lewis. <laughs> Thank you.
Today, Grammy-winning artist Colby Calais performs her new hit single, I'll Be Here. Plus, all rise, Devin Simone is presiding over another session of Relationship Court. And two indigenous artists and friends celebrate their culture through fashion. From Studio 1A in Rockefeller Plaza, it's today with Hoda and Jenna. It all starts right now. So, hey guys. Hey, hey, hey. It is Monday. It is the ninth day of October. Yes. Here we are. Some of y'all may be home from school. Hanging out with us. It's a day off, which is always nice. It sure Don't you is. like a long weekend? Yes. Don't you? It's like a snow day. It's you an wake extra up. It's a day. It's Monday, and you're like, shouldn't I be somewhere? And you're like, and you're like no. no. I need to just be, stay, at, sleep in, no school, no work. You're right where you're supposed to be. By the way, everyone needs those days. Don't, don't yeah. they need yes, My mom reset. used to call them mental health days. Yeah. And she, she called, would oh. give us one basically once a semester. Oh, she, she would? would see, t tell that we wouldn't want to go to school and she'd say, do you want a mental health day? And we would stay with her. Sometimes we'd go to what lunch. What did she do? Oh, Sometimes nice. we would just run errands with her. Yeah. But she just knew. One day, you need yeah. a break. And it wasn't, maybe it was one a year. Yeah. We went to, we never missed school. Of course school. you didn't. And you my kids perfect never attendance. missed school. I know, remember we were like sending our kids no matter what. I know. We were like, you're good enough, just go. It's good enough. <laughs> A hundred percent. Okay, mm -hmm. Catherine McPhee Foster is owning up to a recent mom fail that is quite hilarious. Okay, so her son Rennie had an iPad and um, she hit it. Yeah. She wanted it. She didn't want him to get it. By the it. way, Rennie is older than that baby now. That, right? that, That's no, Rennie. Rennie's much older. Oh, it's, two and a half. Oh. Okay, so anyway, Rennie likes the iPad. Yeah. So she decided she was going to hide it. So where could she hide it where he wouldn't find it? The oven, probably because he's not allowed to get near hot things. <laughs> so she's like, cool, I'll put it in the oven and hide it. So then, forget about it. Next day, okay, time for dinner. I'm going to preheat the oven to get ready to cook. Goes and does her business. Okay. Um, shh, then guess what happens. Oh, you can guess. Her Here friend captured this moment. Why the hell is the iPad in the oven? The iPad is in the oven because he kept asking for it. Wait, can you get it out? Yes, it's out. Can you get it out? Oh my god. You know, I smelled something too. I smelled it and I thought it was just the chicken. I thought it was orange juice chicken. Jeez. Oh no. Don't put electronics into hot things. I know. Well, she didn't know she was, but it was a hiding place. how many times have you hidden something because you wanted to hide it for yourself too? Even like, I'm like, oh, if I put this in here, I'll remember it's in here. And then you go you know to look for it. how many times that's it. happened? A gazillion. One million times. You're like, I know I put it somewhere. Remember? Because you didn't want, it was too sharp yes. for the kid, but you need it. Yes. So I'm going to put place it here yes. in the junk drawer or wherever totally. it was and you never to be found again. No, a hundred times. I mean, a hundred times Henry's like, where did you put that X? And I have, and I knew I hit it. Well, here's the thing. Once you start doing things like, there are so many parenting fails, but Hopi has this thing where she likes something special before she goes to sleep. Can you get me something special? So I, she's in bed. I leave, I go to my room. <laughs> I, I literally <laughs> rummage around. I find an old bracelet. Okay. I go, here, something special. Oh, thanks, Mama. Next night. Can I have something special that I've never seen before? Oh, no. No. You, you started a terrible, this wait, is not wait, good. Wait, wait, wait Here, Jenna. take this to her. <laughs> here, take her this piece of gum. That's good to have. By here, the way. Does she want one of our new cups? They're hot. By the way, I am constantly rummaging for something special. You know what I did? I took an old little zippy earbud uh, case and shoved coins in it last night. Coins and some old plastic ring. And I go, something special. special. Thank you, Mama. Good night. Now, do you As wish you hadn't started yes. this trend? Yes. Every night. It's a lot of pressure. Isn't it weird how little trends, something cute you think is just going to happen For one day, they never forget. They're the smartest kids. Something special. And manipulative. I know. Because guess what? Every and look kid at me wants something special. Foraging around my own okay. apartment trying can to I find something. Can I tell you what I did? And what? I've told you this before, but maybe you can uh. trade in the something special for a mantra that's only hers that you tell her. Okay. She's going to want the things. She's going to want the things. I give her a million mantras. 
We do all that stuff. You it doesn't work. No, you need a, some. She wants to have something that she. But you, pretty soon, unfortunately, it's going to happen with Haley too, and then you're going to have to be finding two special things. I know, because she does say, "Why did Hope get something?" And, and not just something, something I've never seen before. That's the hard part. Well, I know, okay. but just go into any of your drawers oh, yes. and their <laughs> bottomless pits filled with paper clips and hummus and stale chips. And all of that can be special if you make it special. You know? <laughs> funny. You make it's me true, laugh. true, right? Oh, you make me laugh. Um, okay, this is funny. A recent Bustle article caught our, caught our, our attention. The title is, The Thirstiest Thing a Man Can Do is Read. Mm. So according to that's so you. It's true, right? It's hot. It is hot. Thirsty. It's like I'm I'm just I'm just reading. I'm dehydrated when a man takes out a book. You love it. Yeah, like what does it tell you? Okay, you see a man with a book sitting on a park bench in Central Park reading. What is the first thing that you're thinking? Right I mean, now? eyeglasses. Yeah. They have a little eyeglass. Yeah, a little eyeglass. Too. You're in that. Just sitting reading and lost and, in and it. And if they're reading something. Like I respect. What? Oh, now we're getting down oh, that road. I mean, that could be a m means for an affair. I'm just kidding. I would never do yeah. that. But I would never. Henry and I are very happy. And he reads. He does read. Why do you act like, why are you defensive? Because I'm not, because I shouldn't have said that. But I went too far. You but anyway, read. okay. On in nature reading gives you extra points. Wait, wait oh, so if you're in the park oh, reading. in nature. Nature outside. plus glasses plus, plus book, book that I approve of. Let's, let's look at some of these guys. Ryan Reynolds reading. Oh. No, he's not really reading. What's he reading? He's faking. No. <laughs> Michael no, B. Are, Jordan Michael by B. Jordan. the bathtub? Wait, Michael B. is totally immersed. Reading by the bathtub? Channing Tatum is also not reading. <laughs> <laughs> Those are props. Props. No, it, it does matter. matter. No, you have to be because actually. fake reading, actually, you lose a point. There's a whole game here. Michael B. Jordan is the only one that I'm interested in. Yeah. Because he's, the only he's one by a bathtub real. and he's actually reading. Look at him. No, that's real. And he's in a tank top. Okay. Look at him and flexing, flexing while reading. Have you ever had the the boyfriend or the date that Didn't does the read. opposite? Which I don't is like, read. I don't like to read. No, that's not. It's a turn off. That is a turn right? off. Right? You do want someone who's interested in, like, if you Gross. say you want to go to Barnes and Noble, and he goes, no. Then you're right, like, why did I go oh. to Barnes and Noble? Yeah, no, that's a turn off. That's a that's a deal Oof, breaker. But that Michael B. Jordan shot. <laughs> Coming up, what do you do if you get promoted at work? but it causes some resentment among your work friends. Oh gosh, that's such a good one. We're solving your social dilemmas right after this. By the way, he did look cute. And the other ones were. No, I know, fake. so ready. We're going to help you figure out some sticky situations. Yeah, that's right. It's time for Hoda, Hoda and, and Jenna's Jenna Social dilemma. Let's go, let's go. All right, here's the first one. My boss has invited our whole team out for drinks next week. I am 10 weeks pregnant, and nobody knows. We're a small group. It'll be pretty obvious if I'm not drinking. I want to go, but I don't know how to handle it. Oof. Any suggestions? Okay. You so you don't want to tell yet, obviously. It's your own. You, you'll yeah, tell when you're ready. Yeah, 10 weeks is too early. Too early. Could you... Have a seltzer -y yeah, drink? Yeah, get a seltzer. Get a fake drink. Or you could say you're doing dry October. They won't believe it. They know she sober October. Sober October. That rhymes. Well, maybe they know that she drinks. Yeah, but, but some has... people go on breaks. Yeah, it You could don't be. have to always order drinks if other no. people are. But also, I think if you're not making a thing, if you are giving off the vibe of, uh-oh, I'm not drinking and they're going to know, they're going to know. 
And if you just go in and do your thing. Yeah, but I had an th experience yes, with did. a colleague, an unnamed colleague that we know here, mm -hmm. um, where we were on a shoot mm -hmm. and we go to dinner mm -hmm. and I'm, we're sitting and we're having drinks and the waiter and they, she had been having dinner with her husband mm -hmm. and I'd been having dinner with mine and we combined mm -hmm. and the waiter comes up and goes, and here's your mocktail, ma'am. And you knew. And I was like, you knew right there. Girl. And did she fess up right there? Yeah, she fessed up right there. And then in weird turn of events, I had baby Hal before she had her baby. Who? Brittany. Oh, okay. Yeah. She okay. wouldn't care. Yeah, she wouldn't care. Okay. okay. Here's the next one. Go ahead. My best friend has a crush on a guy I knew from college. I know he's a bit of a player, and I told her so. She said she don't care. I know she will still eventually be hurt. What do I do? Let her do her thing. Yeah, mind your own mind business. Your own business. Look, now, it feels a little like she may still have a thing for this guy. Because why does thinking? she care? Well, if the guy is like one of those, you know those guys in high school or college who you knew, who yeah. were always with all the girls, yeah. and, the girl, and you were like, this guy's trouble. I know that guy. Yes. I don't want you to fall into the same trap that all these yeah. other girls. But also people evolve, don't they? Most no. people do. Mm. Men don't as yeah. much. <laughs> I sort of think once a cheater, always a cheater. Yeah, you think so? But we don't know that he was a cheater, do we? I think just say, listen, she's already said he you hurt said me. You said your piece. He yeah. hurt me. He used to be a player. Yeah. And now she knows it. Yeah. So she's got, she's eyes wide, so wide open. Yeah. And I think, and there's not even an I told you so when it happens. Just no. let it be. Let it all go. Okay, here's the last one. Kelly and I <laughs> started working at our company at the same time and we're very close. Recently... I was promoted. I'm now her boss. Ooh, I know that she resents it and is stirring the pot at work, ooh. talking about me to ooh, other ooh, colleagues. Ooh, ooh. How do I handle and still stay her friend? Okay. I think you have to, I think in this moment, you're very transparent. I, I think you have to, you're Be either boss. her boss, you're her boss. That's it. That's it. You know why? Because she's already stirring it up with everybody else. I think. You you made you got promoted, yeah. And you could say to her, "Look, I know this is totally and completely awkward, but I have to. Yeah. I'm in this role now." And I hear that you're saying, "I this, get it," and it's not cool. Right. Yeah. Or maybe you don't even need to yeah. go to the gossip. No. Start with like, listen, uh, we're friends. We're friends. I'm also your boss, and yeah. I, and and I know this, this stinks. This is we awkward. Both we're going yeah. for it, but can, you know, and also, Kelly, I want to give the advice. If you're not happy there, yeah. If it's going to cause you to start creating drama, yeah. then probably another... other people will give you the promotion you wanted. Find another yes. place. Find another gig. Good. Because here's the thing. Creating an atmosphere that's fun to work in yes. can't be toxic. Yes. No, it can't You can't have be. the toxicity. No. So. No. Okay, good. Okay. All right. If you got a social dilemma, head to hodanjenna.com. Hit the connect button. Okay, coming up, y'all, Devin Simone's helping couples hash it out. We're talking relationship court next. Yeah, I think that when you are, that we already did that. to you today every day we are adding to the star power in our studio the biggest names only on today see we're coming in this early right everybody it's today like i won the lottery how do you feel at this age this stage liberated we're just getting started folks anal stuff with us now the boys are back in town the boys are back in town it's a miracle this has been fantastic everything and everyone you're talking about 
only on today. All rise. Yeah. Matchmaker and dating expert Devin Simone is presiding over another edition of Hoda and Jenna's Relationship Court. Okay, we brought in two couples who have a disagreement in their relationship. Each person will present their side of the story, and Devin will issue a final ruling. Judge Devin, are you ready? I'm ready. Okay. All right, Lee, tell us about our first case. It's the case of the date night dilemma. Michaela and Phil are a married couple who also run a business together. They love carving out time for date nights, but don't always agree on the topic of conversation. Oh, dun, dun, dun. Okay, so Phil, we're going to start with you. You'll have 20 seconds to make your case. Let's go. Phil, you're up. I got it. <laughs> your Honor, we're popping at home. We've got four kids, Ooh. four businesses, and I still make a point of it to find time for date night. When I take her out on date night, she wants to talk about business. It's my business partner when we're at work, but this is my wife when we're out on a date. So we just have to find those boundaries. Oh, oh that solid. Bum, Gotta say, bum. solid. Film. Okay, Michaela, that's a hard one to beat, yeah. but let's go. All right, so our businesses are obviously a huge part of our lives. And so when we do get time to go out, it's we're catching up. We have so many different things to talk about. But if I had a really stressful day, he's my person. He's the one I lean on. Like, I can't help but not bring up work. So going out on a date and, and not talking about our businesses is like. Oh, uh -oh. okay. We've got follow-ups. This is very compl complex. It really so. is. All right, Dig Phil, in. let's just start with you. Are you making an effort to steer the conversation away from work? Or do you just say, oh, here we go again? Absolutely. Oh, you do? I even research some things. I'll do a little Instagram post that's just like something to shift your mind, just mm -hmm. get away from it. Just connect as people. Figure out what's, wow. what's really driving us. Okay, okay. well, Michaela, wow. we want to give you a follow-up chance as well. Do you feel like you give Phil enough opportunity during the day to just make sure you can yeah, vent about out. what's going on? No. There's, I'm like chasing him down to talk to him. There is zero time zero in time. the day ah. to talk to him about anything. Okay. All right, it's time, it's time to weigh in, Judge Devin. All right, so time management, right? I understand, Michaela, you wanting to vent and let things off your chest. It's gonna make you more open to connecting on date night. Separate the times. You're gonna have to carve out, even if it's say 15 minutes before you leave to go on date uh, night, for you to download com what happened on the day. But Phil is right. Work is responsibilities. Responsibilities are not sexy. All right, mm -hmm. if y'all were on a first date and you were talking about work the whole time, that would not be cute. Date yeah. night is supposed to be sexy time, intimate, mm -hmm. all the good stuff. So in this instance, I'm gonna have to rule in favor of Phil. Oh. Okay, but Phil, 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 <laughs> Phil, Seriously. But Phil, just so you know, remember, 15 minutes before date night, yeah. you gotta let your wife Absolutely. unpack all maybe, the you. Maybe on the car ride or the walk yes. to wherever you're going, yeah. that then, should be your time. Yes, mm -hmm. and when you get to the restaurant, because I'll tell Stop. you what doesn't feel like sexy time when your man don't hear you. Yeah. You know right. what I mean? Yeah. Right. Right. Yes. That. Yeah. That. <laughs> All right. But you did win, Phil. Yeah. I mean, I'm not the judge. Back to you. I just played one on TV. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Thank you all. Um, okay. You. Lee, can you tell us about our next case, please? It's the case of the disagreement debacle. Lynn and Chris are engaged to be married. They both like to reach a resolution after an argument, but feel differently about how to let the dust settle. Oh, this is so good. All right, Lynn. All right, Chris. You're each going to have 20 seconds to make your case. Lynn, you're first up. Go ahead. All right. So Chris and I have very different needs when it comes to reconciliation. So whenever we have a fight, whether it's big or small, I tend to need more time and space and to understand, and he can just get over it like this. Uh -huh. And so that adds a lot of pressure on me and it actually starts even more fights because he's ready to hug and kiss and I'm just not ready for that. Yeah. Okay. That she makes needs a boundary. Sense. Our girl needs a boundary. I like it. Okay, Chris, mm -hmm. 20 seconds on the clock. Let's Thank go. Thank you, Your Honor. So for <laughs> me, it's not about getting over it quick or not. It's all about the connection. I like to be, I like to feel like when we're resolving it there's the connection the touch the uh -huh. hugs the communication but for her what the the way she just withdraws it feels like a complete disconnect in the relationship okay, okay. well that okay well let's do a couple of follow-ups so lynn you communicate you communicate to chris you need some time do you say to him hey honey give me a minute before you start wrapping me all up here i need i need like 10 minutes to go off to the side do you let him know that oh absolutely as directly as i can and he actually also lets me know 
just come and hug me. Let's dead this. You Let's know? Yeah. yeah. So it, there is communication. It just feels like a real like time difference. Yeah. Yeah. Just mm -hmm. a little bit more time. Okay, Chris, do you know why you feel like you need this sort of instant gratification, like the quick mm -hmm. end? Is there something that um, causes for me, it? For me, it's really just to stay connected in the relationship. Uh, when she mentioned that she does give a time frame, there's no real time frame. Uh, sometimes it's hours, sometimes it's days. One time oh. it was even a week or so. Ooh. Cold shoulder. Cold yeah. sh that shoulder that's can like, feel very icy. And that's like a complete disconnect yeah. on the relationship. Icy. Yeah, a, right, whole, well, a whole week is a long time. Yeah. Yeah. All right, Judge Devin. All right. Well, if you've ever watched one of those competition shows when there's like two people in a team, you know that the team doesn't win until both get over the finish line. Mm -hmm. So you're only as fast as the slowest person. And a microwave and an oven are both very valuable in a kitchen. And a microwave might look at an oven and be like, you take too long. But the oven's going to operate mm -hmm. the way the oven operates. Lynn is an oven. She takes a while, and it's mm -hmm. going to take a while. And you're not going to be able to change that. However, communicating <laughs> cold sugar isn't cool. Oven, all right? It's not cool. So communicating <laughs> and at least setting a guideline of, okay, babe, how about we have this resolved? Just give me 24 hours or just give me 48 hours. Because I think there's a little bit of fear on Chris's part where he feels like, I don't know where she's going and he doesn't want to lose you, which is fair. I think there should valid. be a time limit. I don't think it should be two, two days is too long. Two I think days it has with to the be, person that you're no, no, a person. No. Y'all love each other. I think 24 20, hours 24 is 24 hours fair. max. I think 24 hours max. is fair, but that doesn't mean you're not talking for the 24 hours. That, that just what? means you need time to, yeah. you know, no, but after 20, huggy. yeah, so let's lay down 24 hours. Can we do that? Yeah. Fair enough? Okay. Yeah. Is okay. That okay. So who do you judge with, both of them? So ultimately, <laughs> I'm ruling in favor of both, but I'd say Lynn a little bit more Lynn. than Chris. All okay. right. Okay. Guys, thank, thank you all. <laughs> all right. Thank you. And if you guys, by the by chance, have a case you want heard in our relationship court, and we know you're lining up, head to <laughs> hodenjenna.com, hit the connect button, and share it with us. Coming up, this Indigenous people say meet the co-owners of a small store who are celebrating fashion and their heritage in a big way. In honor of Indigenous Peoples Day, we wanted to celebrate the contributions of Indigenous artists and designers. Yeah, lucky for us, there's a store on the Lower East Side called Relative Arts NYC where you can shop for contemporary fashion while honoring the past. Take a look. Clothing, artwork, and beaded jewelry color the walls of the small shop where all the items are made by Native artists and designers. It's not just about a garment on a rack. There's stories behind a lot of the work. Many of the designs are upcycled. That's something that is important to us as well as to focus on sustainability because Indigenous people are the original stewards. The shop is run by Indigenous owners Karina Imrek and Leanna Shuey. They met in 2015 and formed an instant bond. One thing that was missing when we moved to New York from our original homelands was community. When we realized that there wasn't really a space or a landing pad in New York City for Indigenous people to celebrate Indigenous art that was also open to the public, 
we wanted to create that. In April 2023, they opened doors to Relative Arts NYC. A lot of people who are in town visiting from their homelands make us a destination. We've hosted events from an album listening party. We've had kind of just like mixers and pop-ups. A place where people can shop, gather, and feel inspired. I'm a member of the Walker River Paiute tribe, and it's taken me a while to find community here in New York. Seeing so many young indigenous creatives inspired me to then start making my own designs. It keeps my family's practices while also hopefully inspiring my cousins to find their own way. I think it's really empowering that the city has really given me a, a chance to have this community this ability to be able to come into a space run by a Native woman. The matriarch's in the making. Karina runs the fashion side of the boutique. She has her own sustainable fashion line called Emmy Studio, competed on Project Runway, and her work has been displayed at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. My work is such an expression and a storytelling of a lot of my background and my heritage. I was really proud growing up um, Puyallup. I was a jingle dress dancer in powwows, so my jingle dress was the very first dress that I ever made, and I think that's what started me in my career in fashion. Leanna organizes the community programming and events for the store. By day, she works as an educator at the New York Historical Society. I grew up in Indian Territory in Oklahoma, so there was no lack of indigenous right representation. It's definitely something that I was always really proud of and would kind of like assert and tell people when I was like in grade school and coming up, like, I'm native, I'm Creek. <laughs> but it's definitely carries a new weight and responsibility as I've gotten older. Together, they found a way to share their traditions and heritage through fashion. It's for everyone to kind of see that we are here. We are here now and we carry our traditions, our ancestors, and continue to look ahead for, you know, generations to come. Joining us now, the co-founders of Relative Arts NYC, Karina Emmerich and Leanna Shuey. Ladies, we're so blown away yeah. by what you've been able to create and just the imprint you've made for your community. It must feel pretty good. Yeah, it's been amazing. It's been an amazing ride so far. We just opened April 1st, so we're still new. <laughs> wow. Well, I, what I love about this is that you didn't feel like there was a space for your mm -hmm. community, so you created it. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, you already are artists and designers mm -hmm. and have all these talents, but to bring everybody together, how meaningful is that? It's, it's everything, um, especially in a place like New York City where it can be really hard to kind of find any community, no matter who you are. Um, and people coming here from across the United States who are indigenous and to be able to like find a space that just feels comfortable and welcoming to be that kind of landing pad. Um, it's it's all I've ever wanted to do. It's well, amazing. You can, you can feel the pride, you guys, in your community and all the other people who are featured in the story. Every time someone popped up, you're like, oh my God, there he is, oh my God, there they are. It's cool. And we love that you make these pieces by hand. Will you come yes. and show us? Yes. Because yeah, the, totally. the pieces that you make take time and love and care. Yeah, and Karina, you designed yeah. this coat, mm -hmm. which is similar to the one you're wearing. It's right here next to her. Beautiful. Right. So yeah. talk about these pieces. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so this coat is um, its uh, one of the iconic Emmy Studio mm -hmm. coats. Emmy Studio is my clothing line. Um, it's all handmade to order, so it's sustainably made. Mm -hmm. um, wool is a cradle-to-cradle -cradle fabric, so uh, we love this one. It's one of the most iconic Emmy Studio how, coats. How long does it take you to make one of those by hand? I can, It takes me about a week if I do normal hours, <laughs> but sometimes I'll stay up all night working. Because you love it like that. Yeah. Okay, now talk about some of these designers yeah. that y'all also um, yeah. have. Yeah, so we have the um, wax-coated canvas coat by mm -hmm. GNU. GNU is the first Native American-owned denim collection. Mm. Wow. Um, Look at the inside. It's yeah, so beautiful. beautiful. Let's see. Oh, yeah, yeah cool. That's a P Pendleton wool that was mm -hmm. designed by Diani Whitehawk. Mm -hmm. um, and I like the pants and the added uh, sash on yeah. the bottom. Yeah, the pants are by Section 35. Mm -hmm. um, and what about the T-shirt? 
So our t-shirt, we really wanted to acknowledge the traditional homelands of the Lenape people. Yeah. So instead of the I Heart New York shirt, we wanted to do the I Heart Lenape Hoking uh -huh. shirt. And 30% of the proceeds of these shirts do go to language preservation with the Muncie, Delaware Language and History Group. Amazing. This is cool. And these hats we saw. Yes, uh, she, the designer. The designer was featured. Yeah. But we like the bling on the side. <laughs> that was clever, right? Yeah. She did a great job. What's I bet her you name? these are good sellers. Her name's Taylor Yucatel, and mm -hmm. she hand beads all of the hats, and they're inspired by her cradle board. Look at the child. look at it's the earrings, so JBH. Cool. Look at the earrings. And these are her Those. earrings too. Those are by Copper Canoe Woman. Amazing. Um, well, they're salmon ghost earrings. Beautiful. They're the way, very cool. Yeah, what y'all are doing yeah, is remarkable. And you're giving a voice to so many people, so yeah. many different designers. Yeah. You're not saying this is all for me. This is for us. Yes. Exactly. Yeah. Well, you guys are doing a great job. Thank you so much yeah, for having thank me. You you so I love that y'all are today. creating community. It's amazing. Mm -hmm. Coming up, we're going to play our favorite new game. It's called Categories. That's next. <laughs> Games. It's called Categories. There's only one person that can host only this Only one. There's only one. He is our associate producer, Ben Bass. Come on, Ben. Ben, hey. take it away. Hey, Odin. Should we play some categories? Yes, let's, let's play, play it. All right. So today, you are playing categories for Kathy Boitano Grandi. She's from Healdsburg, California. And here's how it works. So each round, you'll see a list of names along with a category. So you have to figure out which five of those names fit into the category. Okay. Three don't, three strikes, you're out. But each time you win, Kathy wins a prize. How about that? Okay, okay. we want to win for Come Kathy, on, Kathy. Ben. Gotta we win for Kathy. Win. So this yeah. first round, you're playing for a brand new Hoda and Jenna. Those, Those hogs are hot. Big deal. Really we, big deal. Yeah. We can't, we're keeping, we really can't keep them in the store. No, we can't. They're flying off the shelves. Okay. So here are the names. And your first category is Lady Gaga songs. So which five okay. of these songs are by Gaga? Bad, Bad Romance, Born, Born, Born This, this way. way. Two. Judas. Yeah. Is that it? How yes, many that's correct. Have? You have three, just two more. Oh, two more. Oh, I don't know. Stupid loss. No. I don't know those. I Me mean, neither. No tears left to cry. Oh, that is an no, awesome. No, extraterrestrial. That is a Katy Perry song. Oh, All right, two strikes. Like one more. Applause. Yes, that's correct. One line. One more correct oh, gosh, answer. Please, please. Hey. I don't know. Candyman. Oh. Oh, no. Song. Okay, listen. Hey. We started so. You started strong. We don't know the ones that are deep on the playlist. Some that's the deeper trouble. cuts. Some deeper cuts. I love no. Okay, it's okay. It's okay. Kathy, it's okay. Don't you worry. Because, because here's the thing. Next round, it gets a little harder, but the prize gets bigger. It gets so, harder. Okay, just a we got bit. it. Come on, Jill. So let's you're go. playing to see if Kathy can win a Hoda and Jenna sweatshirt. Okay. So here are our five names. Let's get them on the board. And your category is Starbucks menu items. So okay. five of these are on the menu at Starbucks. Okay, I know that the vanilla bean culotte. Yeah, is. definitely. That is a Dunkin' no? Donuts. Story. The salted caramel cream cold brew. Yeah, that's correct. Okay. The yeah. pumpkin spice latte. Yeah, yeah. Sure. yeah. Okay, yep, 100%. Okay. The ice toasted vanilla oat milk shake and espresso. Yes, correct. Okay, wait, you got three, 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 three,
You are getting the sweatshirt. All right, okay. last round. Oh, last Hardest round. category. Biggest prize, Hoda and Jenna swag bag. Swag bag, let's right. go. So let's, let's get our go. five. Come on, let's Maybe get our names on Maybe we can throw in the mug. Oh, it has a mug. It has a mug. <laughs> so there are your names. The category is Barbie's Jobs. Oh, I, girl, Barbie's astronaut. Oh, yes. astronaut. Astronaut. Astronaut's Hold correct. correct. Definitely. Go ahead. Okay, ballerina Barbie. Yes, that's correct. My brain. You got two? Oh, no. Travel agent Barbie. Yeah, you got it. Um, astrophysicist Barbie. Yes, she was. Oh my God, one more, one more. We played Barbies a lot. Archery Barbie. No, no, no. 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 Oh, Wait, you got okay. the Barbie. We got time. Okay. Paleontologist Barbie. You got it. Yes. Happy no. to the swag bag. And you get the mug, Kath. Listen, yeah. the mug anyway. So it you would have had two mugs, but now you just need one. Kathy's going to be very happy. She's got the, the All sweatshirt of it. and the swag bag. Okay. Way to go, Ben. We Excellent, you, Ben. Excellent job. Excellent job. Okay. All right, coming up, a performance by the incredibly talented Colby Calais. Coming up right after this. The City Music Series on Today is proudly presented to you by City. Two Grammys, eight number one radio singles, 15 billion streams. You know what that spells? That spells Colby Calais, and she is one talented artist. Yeah, now Colby is out with her first ever country album. It is called Along the Way. We were saying this morning, Colby, that you have that kind of country so Like We Vibe. felt like you have been yeah. sort of singing folksy songs yeah. always. I mean, I kind of have. You know, I've, I'm a singer-songwriter and I actually, last time I was here was when I sang with my band Gone West. Mm -hmm. and we had a country album and I've been going to Nashville for 15 years writing and singing with country artists and I live there now and it's just kind of embedded and well, so when we, we knew that you and Cheryl Crow had a had a duet, it made perfect sense. Totally. It's like oh. two puzzle pieces. It was always meant to be. How did that come to be? So she had me tour with her about 10 years ago, which was the best tour ever. <laughs> and a few years ago, I asked her if she would uh, sing on a song with me, and she said yes. But I didn't do my record for it took me so long. Yeah. So uh, a couple months ago, I asked her, are you still cool to <laughs> do that? And yeah. she said, yeah. And we recorded the vocal at her house, and she's amazing. And this is the song that you're going to be singing for us today. What's what's the name of it? It's called I'll Be Here, and it's just about being there for the ones you love. Oh my All gosh. right. Perfect. Colby Calais, take it away. Alone, when you're feeling low and you just don't know where to run to. Something to believe in If you're looking for a light to guide you home Just look inside your light shining brighter than you know You should know I'm never gonna let you down Always gonna build you up Me, I'm feeling lost I will always find you love Never gonna walk away Always gonna have your back if nothing else, you can always come on back. When you need me, I will be here. I'll be here. I'll be here. I'll be here. Ooh, 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 ooh. 
laugh. I will make you laugh if you ever feel like crying. Close. I will hold you close. You won't be alone anymore. If you need someone to believe it, you're reaching for a hand to guide you home. Just take my hand and I won't let you go. You should know I'm never gonna let you down. Always gonna build you up. We are feeling lost, I will always find you love. Never gonna walk away, always gonna have your back. And if nothing else, you can always come on back. When you need me, I will be here. I'll be here. I'll be here. Never gonna walk away, always gonna have your back. And if nothing else, you can always count on that. When you need me, I will. Beautiful! Wow! Gorgeous! Gorgeous! Oh my gosh! So beautiful! I'm so happy you're here. And you saw your posse from Mississippi's in the house. They came. Look, they were outside, and we decided, you know what? They need to come inside. Little audience for you. Okay, Colby's first ever country album, although it feels like it was always right there in her along the way. It is out now. Downloaded. Y'all get it. Don't forget, we'll be back right after this. So and by the way, she also hasn't changed a stitch. No. no. That's the other crazy. this holiday with us. Yes, we enjoyed it. Okay, coming up tomorrow, y'all, the one and the only Reba McIntyre is going to perform for us. Plus, fresh off the Renaissance Tour, Beyonce's backup dancers, the twins are here. We can't wait for that. And our pal, pal Justin, Sylvester, he's got the scoop. Enjoy your Monday. What's tomorrow? Well, tomorrow's Tuesday, but it's going to be That's confusing because right. it's going to feel like a Monday, but That's it's actually right. a Tuesday. Bye. Welcome to today. So happy to see you guys. Would you like my boost? Yes. Get back. Here we go. Boom. Boom. Sometimes we just do things to help. <laughs> That's our Hoda. Happy birthday. We got an awesome crowd, y'all. i
by Walmart. What up, y'all? Welcome to the Today All Day Kitchen. Pasta is a staple for so many weeknight meals. It's easy to make, pretty hard to screw up, and oh so satisfying. I'm making pillowy soft ricotta gnocchi with peas and parm in a buttery sauce. And I'm cooking up a creamy chicken stroganoff with baby bella mushrooms. And I'm whipping up a spicy vegan pasta a la vodka. So start boiling some water. It's time to use that noodle. And let's get cooking. You can shop the ingredients featured here from our sponsor, Walmart, by scanning the QR code. Today earns a commission from purchases made through links on today.com. I have to admit, pasta is one of my go-to comfort foods, so I am very excited to share this recipe with you. The first thing we wanna do is take our gorgeous ricotta and actually lay it out in a thin layer on paper towels. Since the ricotta is the base of our dough, we need to remove some of that moisture so it ends up really nice and light and fluffy rather than dense. We are going to let this sit for about 12 to 15 minutes just to make sure that the paper towel absorbs that moisture, but lucky for me, I made one before. And here is how it ends up looking when it is done. Stunning. Okay, so now let's just make our dough. We have our ricotta right here. Plop it right on in. So we have two large eggs here. I'm going to crack them right into our bowl. One cup of finely grated Parmigiana Reggiano cheese and some kosher salt, just to awaken the flavor. Before we add in our flour, we are going to delicately mix it all together. So it creates a really light, fluffy consistency. So now that this is looking really beautifully mixed together, that is when we know it is time to start adding in our flour. It's really important here to add your flour in a quarter cup at a time because we don't wanna to develop too much gluten, but we also wanna make sure that our ricotta stays nice and fluffy. I'm just going to delicately mix it until there are no more big bits of flour, and we'll just keep mixing our final quarter cup. There we go, looking good. Now it is time to shape our gnocchi. And then we're going to take our dough mixture, kind of form it into a bit of a, it feels so good. It feels like a baby's bottom. Can we use that in the final cut? <laughs> it's what it feels like, okay. And now we're going to dust the top with a bit more flour. And this is my favorite tool whenever I'm making pasta, also whenever I'm cooking to easily pick things up. It is called a bench scraper. It's typically used for decorating cakes, making sure you have a nice smooth line of frosting around your cake, but it does such a good job of picking things up and it also does a great job of cutting things really evenly. And we are going to cut this into quarters. And the next thing we're going to do is we are going to roll this out into a beautiful snake that is about one inch thick. It feels so nice, <laughs> so soft. I like to cut off the end first, just because this end, it doesn't look as nice. And then what I'll do is I will just keep cutting little one inch pieces of pasta. And look at that. They look like little pillows, don't they? Look at how beautiful this is looking. And what we're going to do is we'll take that same bench scraper that we have, lift them up, and transfer them to a parchment-lined baking sheet. All right, and we're just going to repeat this with our remaining 
pieces of gnocchi dough. Looking good. Before we cook our gnocchi, I wanna get started on the star of our sauce. This is a lemon butter sauce, so we are going to be using the zest and juice of two gorgeous lemons. And I'm going to show you my favorite way to prepare lemon zest. So we're just going to take the peeler and run it along lengthwise on this lemon, pulling the zest off of the lemon. So I'm just gonna remove any of this extra pith. And the reason why I'm removing this pith is because the pith is a bit bitter and we don't want any of that bitterness. And as you can see, I've stacked up all of this lemon into cute little, almost soldiers, if you will. Take your knife and rock it back and forth along that peel. It smells amazing. And you can see how beautiful these strips are. And then what we'll do is we'll take these shreds and turn them, and then we will run our knife across again to mince that lemon. And it took me a while to master these skills, let me tell you. It really all comes down to practicing over and over and over again. It's really repetition here. And now I'm just gonna take my knife and run through this a few more times. It's smelling absolutely amazing. Look at that zest though. I mean, it's like freshly fallen snow. <laughs> okay, let's clean up, get our water a boiling, and finish up this gnocchi. Our water is boiling, it is time to cook our gnocchi and you gotta pay attention because this all happens pretty quickly. But I promise you, you have all of the tools to absolutely crush it. The first thing we wanna do is salt our water. I'm taking kosher salt. Okay, this is boiling beautifully and we can use our fingers to plop these in because let me tell you, they are light and pillowy and Dropping them all in at once is going to cause them to smush together. We want these to cook until they float to the top, okay? They basically tell us, they're like, hey, what's up? And then to save some time, we are actually going to take our frozen peas and we're gonna pop those in as well. So this pasta water is liquid gold. I call it unicorn juice when I'm cooking because all of the starch in the water itself is actually going to help bind our sauce together. And we're going to start adding in our cubed unsalted butter a couple tablespoons at a time. You really want it to be cold butter because our goal here is to really emulsify everything. Take a whisk. Start whisking everything up. The gnocchi's starting to float. And now we are ready to bring our sauce and our gnocchi together. I've actually turned off the heat. If it is too hot, it may cause your sauce to break. So just make sure you turn that heat off. Next up, we're going to add in half of our lemon zest. How good does this look? Okay, next up, we are going to slowly add in our parm. Keep on mixing it back and forth so that it melts in a nice, even fashion. It is smelling so good. And as you can see, it is really looking super glossy. Mm, and it is tasting delish. So add in the lemon juice a little bit at a time. Again, we want to emulsify this in. We don't want to freak out the gorgeous sauce that we just worked so hard to build. It is coating all of those beautiful pillows of gnocchi. And now it is time to plate it up. Oh my gosh, you guys, how gorgeous does this look? Okay, a little extra parm. 
some freshly ground black pepper. And then I'll take a little bit of fresh mint, a little drizzle of olive oil. Gives the pasta gorgeous sheen. And there you go, homemade ricotta gnocchi in a lemon butter sauce with peas and mint. I'm so excited to try this. It is melting in my mouth. The parm adds the perfect amount of nuttiness and saltiness. I don't have any other words to say except I know you're gonna love this. Mm. So good. When you hear stroganoff, you're probably thinking beef, but this creamy comfort food pairs incredibly well with chicken. But the best part about this dish is that it all comes together in one pot. Less mess is always a win in my kitchen. All right, so first we're gonna do is we're gonna make our dry rub. I like to use a little bit of smoked paprika. You can use the regular paprika too, but I think smoke flavors just bring a lot more body to your recipes. And then a little bit of dry thyme, and then a little bit of garlic powder. Give that a good swish. All right, now let's move on to our chicken breast. Now I've just got some lean, skinless chicken breasts, and I'm not sure about you, but I like to cut mine up into smaller pieces. The reason why, it's gonna cook a lot faster. All right, y'all, let's add this to our bowl. Get your hands all up in there. Don't be scared to get your hands dirty. I'm gonna just rinse off the cutting board and wash our knife so we can prep the mushrooms. Okay, now I'm gonna be using some Baby Bella mushrooms. I think they're super delicious. I'm just gonna slice this into small slices just like this. So I've got a ton of mushrooms here and you're probably thinking, yo, okay, that's not gonna fit in my pan. Don't worry, mushrooms are kinda like spinach. Once you start cooking them and add some heat to them, they shrivel up really, really small. So they will fit, I promise you that. Our mushrooms are cut up. I'm gonna set these aside. And now we're gonna fire up our pan and get cooking. All right, we're gonna place this on a medium high heat. Okay, with it nice and hot, in goes the oil. This is a little bit of olive oil, a little bit of heart health, a little sprinkle of that. Then I like to grab some tongs and in goes our chicken. Ooh, I love that sizzle sound. We want a nice sear, a nice color on the chicken. There we go. You're gonna wanna cook this for about four to five minutes on each side, and then look at this. Oh, just lift it up. And look at that beautiful color on the chicken. Move it around a little bit. If you're feeling brave, you can go ahead and toss it. But again, this is a no mess recipe, so <laughs> the least amount of mess you can make in your kitchen, the better. This chicken is just about ready. I'm gonna move my mushrooms a little bit closer. And then 
I'm gonna use my tongs. I'm gonna start taking out the pieces of chicken. Oh my God, look at that. It's just looking so good. Kev, you did that. If you're not your best cheerleader in the kitchen, I don't know what you're doing. You gotta just give yourself a pat on the back. It smells so good, it looks so good. Exactly what we want. I set this over here. Now, I'm gonna add in the mushrooms now. Now, there's a lot of chicken flavor here. Ready, so we want that. Oh, we've got a good sear here. I'm just gonna wilt them just a little bit by using a little bit of our chicken broth. That's a little bit, just to create some steam. And also, this is gonna help to deglaze the bottom of our skillet as well. I'm gonna get my salt bay on. Give me a little pinch of salt. Just a little bit, mm -mm. boom. And the cool thing about mushrooms is that as they're shrinking up too, you know they're just soaking up all this flavor. So people that say, I don't like mushrooms. I'm like, yo man, mushrooms are like flavor bombs. They make your mouth water. It's that umami factor. More love to mushrooms this year. Now we're gonna try to create a little bit of a thick gravy here. We're gonna add in a little bit of flour. I'm gonna give this a quick toss first. And then we're gonna add in about a cup of our chicken broth. And what you'll see here, you're gonna still deglaze, but you see now the chicken broth is really cloudy. And that's because it's turning into that gravy that we want. I'm also gonna add in a little bit of Dijon. And just keep stirring, keep stirring. And this is looking beautiful. All right, now let's begin to bring everything together. In goes our chicken broth. Reserve some, then grab yourself the egg noodles, sprinkle those on, and then pour in the rest of that broth. And the noodles are going to absorb all of this liquid that's now like a gravy. So we're gonna bring it to a light simmer and you can see right here inside that the little light simmer going. That's just about right. And then we're gonna cover and cook this for about seven minutes. Oh my gosh, I stirred these once. Oof, they are looking good. Always check your noodles. And if you're thinking like, Kev, it's looking a little watery, what am I gonna do? Don't worry, I got you. Remember that it's gonna thicken up as it cools, but also it's gonna thicken up because we're going to add in our Greek yogurt now. Greek yogurt is really high in protein and it's really, really, really thick. And look at this. It looks like I added cheese, but I have not at all. And this is our swap for sour cream. Last bit of work, we're gonna add in our chicken. Well, you can't be here to smell it, but I'm just gonna describe it. We need that smell of vision from Willy Wonka. So I'm gonna plate it right here and finish it off with some fresh parsley. You like some other chicken? Try this chicken stroganoff. You're seeing it first here today and then today all day kitchen. I'm just gonna hit it with some fresh black pepper. Ooh, look at that. I don't know about y'all, but I'm excited about eating. Here we go. Get a little bit of mushroom, a little bit of noodle, and then some of this succulent, lean chicken breast. Oh my God. Mm. Yeah, this will make you get happy in church. Ooh, there you go. <laughs> I guarantee your friends and family are going to love this dish.
grew up on Staten Island, so I can't even tell you how many pasta dishes I've eaten over the years. One of my absolute favorites is penne alla vodka. So today, I'm giving that beautiful pink sauce a vegan makeover. And I'm putting a little twist on that penne too. Let's get started with the crunchy breadcrumb topping. So first, I'm gonna get a small skillet over medium-low heat, and we're gonna add in a little bit of olive oil. So for our breadcrumbs, we're gonna use panko breadcrumbs. I love using panko because it's extra crunchy and it's plain, so we can add anything to it and really manipulate those flavors. And the way we're gonna do that is by adding some red chili flakes because we want this spicy and a little bit of nutmeg to really round out those flavors and add that earthy component. A little bit of kosher salt and a little bit of freshly ground black pepper. And just we're gonna cook this over medium low until it gets a nice golden brown color. So we're essentially just toasting it in the pan. This usually takes about five minutes to get nice and golden and crispy. This is a test. If it loosely moves in the pan, that means it's ready. So to start off any good sauce, you have to start off with your aromatics. We're gonna start with one medium white onion and some garlic. So we just wanna get a small dice on this. And next up, garlic. We're using about four cloves of garlic. I just like to give them a light crush to help me with the chopping process. Another great way to prep all of this is actually just blitzing it up in a food processor. Just putting it on chop and giving it a few pulses and it'll all be roughly chopped. So you wanna start off with a really large pan and get it over medium high heat. To this, we're gonna add a layer of olive oil and we're also gonna add in one tablespoon of vegan butter. Traditional vodka sauce is so indulgent and creamy so we're gonna add a few vegan options to help bring that creaminess to the sauce. So now that our oil is hot and the butter is sizzling, let's go in with our onion and garlic. You also wanna get some salt in at this point because that's gonna help the onions sweat out all of their moisture. Now, I said this was spicy vodka sauce, so now come in our spicy elements. We're gonna add some red chili flakes, but let's not stop there. We're gonna add in one of my favorite chili peppers, Calabrian chilies. And I just so happen to be wearing chili earrings to celebrate the occasion. So we wanna cook these for about five minutes until the onions are sweating and almost translucent. So now let's go in with our tomato paste. The tomato paste is gonna add basically a really concentrated tomato flavor. So it's gonna feel like we've been cooking this sauce all day, but really, we haven't been. So get this incorporated into the onions. So, the star of the show, some vodka. No, this is not a shot for me. This is for the pasta, maybe that'll be later. So once we add the vodka in, all of that alcohol is gonna evaporate, so you don't have to worry about any alcohol actually being in there, but the flavor of the vodka will become concentrated, which is what adds that unique flavor to vodka sauce, which I happen to love. We're gonna go in with some crushed tomatoes. We're gonna go in with a little sugar. Now, don't hate on this. This is really gonna help balance the flavors again. There's a lot of acidity in the tomatoes, and then we also have a lot of spice, so the sugar is gonna help round everything out. As well as some dried oregano. So I actually like to take this and rub it in between my fingers to get the oils in the oregano activated. We want our spicy vodka sauce to be smooth and silky, and in order to achieve that, we're gonna use an immersion blender. This looks great, look how vibrant that is. It really is starting to look like vodka sauce. So now we're gonna add a few dairy elements to our sauce. We're gonna add a little bit of vegan creamer, as well as some vegan cream cheese. So you wanna make sure to incorporate all of that in, 
and you can see the color is this beautiful light orange vodka sauce color. We're gonna add in one whole sprig of fresh basil, right in, and we're gonna let that simmer with the sauce. Okay, let's check in our pasta water. Oh, it's boiling. Before we do anything, we always wanna salt our pasta water. And now for our pasta. I just wanna show you guys how fun this is. So this is called a colony Pompeii. I think colony means column and Pompeii is obviously a city in Italy. But to me, it's just a beautiful large fusilli and it looks delicious to eat. So we're gonna get these in. This pasta is so big, it takes about 10 or 12 minutes to cook. So I'm gonna start cleaning up and get everything out of the way and get ready to plate. Our pasta looks ready, so let's add it into our vodka sauce. Beautiful. This is so fun. Look at these swirls. And this is liquid gold. This is our starchy salted water. So we're actually gonna add a little ladle into our pasta to make it even silkier. Want to make sure to gently combine this with the sauce because we don't want to break up our beautiful giant swirls of pasta. Look how fun this looks. I'm so excited to eat it, but we can't forget about our spicy, crunchy breadcrumb topping. So it's now completely cooled, so we can just use our hands to garnish it as if we were garnishing it with Parmesan. And then if you want to be extra fancy, you can add a little sprig of fresh basil. Okay, I've waited long enough, so we're now ready to dig in. I'm so excited to eat this shape. I feel like the proper way is from the bottom. Wow, I think Staten Island would be proud. This is so delicious and so fun. Look at that. Chef's kiss. This is delicious. Sponsored by Walmart. Welcome to the Today All Day Kitchen. I'm Elena Besser. I'm Priyanka Knight. I'm Kevin Curry, and we're whipping up our favorite 30 minute meals for the Today table. Don't get me wrong, I love spending time in the kitchen to unwind. But there are some days when you just want to get dinner on the table fast. So today we're making three speedy recipes that are just perfect for busy weeknights. I'm making a twist on falafel for all of you buffalo wing lovers out there. I'm making a savory stuffed French toast. 
I'm making chicken gyros that can be grilled up in a flash. Set your timer and set the table. It's time to get cooking. You can shop the ingredients featured here from our sponsor Walmart by scanning the QR code. Today earns a commission from purchases made through links on today.com. I absolutely love buffalo wings. I am so obsessed that I actually have a photo of wings hanging above my bed. Anyway, I also love the food and flavors from Israel. Half of my family lives there and I am always inspired by their cuisine. So today I am creating a mashup of my favorite foods, buffalo wings and falafel. The first thing I'm gonna do is jazz up my favorite hot sauce. So we are going to add in cubed butter to a saucepan over a medium heat. A nice gorgeous cup of hot sauce. You can use whatever favorite hot sauce you have on hand. And then for a little extra pizzazz, we are adding in some garlic powder. And we are going to whisk this together until all of that butter is melted and we have a nice gorgeously orange sauce. And this is going to happen very quickly. Okay, we will set this aside. And let's get going on our falafel. So to save time in this recipe, because we really wanna make sure that we keep it in the 30 minute mark, we are using canned chickpeas. I know this could be controversial, don't tell my cousins back in Israel. We're gonna start by pulsing these up. See that? It looks really nice and ground up. So we are transferring these back into the bowl from whence they came, and we will mix up the rest of our ingredients. Shallot. A shallot is awesome. It's kind of like a combination of an onion and garlic. It has those nice garlic notes in it. So we are going to rock our knife back and forth like so until we get about a tablespoon's worth of shallot. And this is gonna go into our creamy dill sauce, which is basically like a fun yogurt-based version of ranch. I'm a ranch gal. If you're a blue cheese person, feel free to add a little bit of blue cheese to that mixture. Pop it into a little bowl. With the rest of this, since it's all going into the food processor, so I've got my shallot. I got one clove of garlic. We are now going to add in some chili flake. And then we are also going to add in some parsley. And we are adding in more of my favorite, <laughs> the garlic powder. Hit it with a teeny bit of salt, a little bit of freshly ground black pepper. We're gonna give it a nice fine chop. But this is really giving us a gorgeous green color. It smells so fresh. Okay, so we're just gonna take this mixture and we are going to add it to our chickpeas. In order to make sure all of this falafel goodness binds together, we are going to add in some cornstarch. And then we are going to add in a little bit of baking powder to give it some lift. We're going to add some kosher salt as well. And then we are going to, again, fold this mixture together. I'm gonna go get a new pan so we can fry up our falafel. We're using neutral oil here. Pour that right into a heavy bottom skillet. I have a little scooper to help me create these into one ounce portions. You'll just kind of press that mixture into the cookie scoop. And then we're going to push it down. Okay, our oil is properly preheated. We have our falafel ready to rock. Let's fry these up. Make sure that you don't overcrowd the pan because we're going to want to move these around a bit as they cook. 
And we wouldn't be able to do that if it's too crowded in there. Even before I flip these, you can see how it is starting to get nice and golden brown on the edges. That is what we're looking for, and that is when we know we're getting really close to flipping these falafel. Ah, uh, yeah. Check that out. Now that these are done and draining on a wire rack, I'm gonna sprinkle them with some salt. And then I'm gonna fry up this next batch and when we get back, we will make our creamy dill sauce. My falafel is all fried up and now I'm going to make a creamy dill sauce. Let's get into it. We have a beautiful cup of full fat Greek yogurt here and we're just gonna take that minced shallot that we prepared earlier. We wanna add in the juice and zest of some lemon. Take any of that extra zest that's hanging out. We will slice this lemon in half, and then citrus press, such a great tool. We are going to add in a little bit of kosher salt, some freshly ground black pepper. Just going to twist off those beautiful fronds of dill. We're looking for about two tablespoons of dill here. Add some garlic powder right on in. And because Greek yogurt tends to be on the thicker side, what I like to do is I like to add a little bit of room temperature water just to thin it all out and make it a more spreadable consistency for our pita. I love to create a little carrot salad to go with this. We're going to combine some dill pickles for a little extra brininess and some added crunch. We are just going to slice these into thin matchsticks. So we'll start by going lengthwise, really thin down those pickles, and we will take our knife and we'll just rock it back and forth to get these really nice thin strips of pickle. Put them into this big bowl here, and next up, it's carrot time. And we are going to start by just peeling the exterior off of these carrots, like so. So the next thing we're going to do is we're just gonna take our carrot and from top to bottom, we are going to slice these carrots into beautiful ribbons. Look at that, gorgeous. Add that to the bowl and just keep on going. Next up, we are going to add the juice of our lemon, just to bring out even more brightness in this salad that we're creating. 
We also wanna make sure that we add in our parsley and we're going to bunch this on up and give it a nice fine chop. It's almost time for dinner. Okay, season it with a little bit more kosher salt, a little freshly ground black pepper, and then a nice drizzle of olive oil. So I'm just gonna give this a good toss. Beautiful. All of our components are done. I am ready to assemble the meze platter. Let's start with our carrot salad. So this is looking gorgeous. It is time to adorn our falafel in our sauce. So I'm just gonna take this sauce, take a brush, and brush it right over the tops. And then we're gonna do a little flipperoo. Make sure we get them on both sides. We've been working so hard to do this, so it's time. Let's get after it. This is the best way to get that sauce in every bite. Then we're going to take a little bit of our salad, pop that in the bottom, take a couple of our little falafel nuggets. I'm gonna put three in there. Yeah, full house. A little bit more sauce in there. Oh my goodness. Check it out. Hold for sound effects. Mmm. Wow. It is warm and crunchy and fresh from that salad. The buffalo is giving me the perfect amount of heat. And that creamy dill, it just mellows it all out. I love this. I know your whole entire family is going to love this. One of my favorite food memories is enjoying the spicy egg-coated toast my uncle and auntie would make for us on our annual family trips to India. They lived on a large farm, so everything we ate was incredibly fresh. When I went vegan, I wanted to recreate that experience, but without those farm fresh eggs. Well guys, I think I've cracked the code with this recipe for my savory Indian French toast. Let's start things off with the vegan batter. Okay, so first we're gonna dice up one small red onion. We're actually gonna just give these a fine dice and then we're gonna saute it up a little bit. So let's get our nonstick skillet on medium high heat. 
And while that heats up, we're gonna coat it with some neutral oil. So let's get these red onions in. It's exactly what you wanna hear. You want them to evenly cook throughout. This looks awesome. Just wanna show you the coloring on this. They're nice and glossy. This is exactly what we want. So we're gonna turn the heat off and just let them sit. This is our next main component to the batter. So we're using Thai green chilies. I never de chilies, nor should you. So we're basically just gonna run our knife through this and give this a rough chop. Now that we've minced up our green chilies, we wanna get started on our batter. So we're using chickpea flour, which we call basin flour at home, which is simply ground dried chickpeas. And to this, we're gonna actually whisk in some water. And you wanna do this gradually because the chickpea flour can easily clump up. So our batter is looking good. The next ingredient that we wanna prepare are some dried spices. So in my mortar and pestle, I'm gonna add one of my favorite spices from my masala dabi, cumin seeds, or what we call jeera. So we're just gonna add the whole cumin seeds here. We're gonna take our pestle and we're gonna grind them down just to a rough grind. Okay, great. So we have a rough grind on our cumin, which is beautiful. So I'm gonna add that to our batter and we're gonna add our green chilies and we're gonna add some salt. And then we wanna add our sauteed onions. You're probably wondering, Priyanka, what is going on with the sauteed onions? Well, don't worry, they're waiting for us. So I'm gonna mix this up and you wanna be gentle when mixing it because you don't wanna break up the chilies and the onions in there. And we have one more ingredient to add to our batter some fresh coriander. This is gonna add a lot of freshness and brightness. We're gonna get it right into the batter. Give that a quick mix. And now it's time to start assembling our French toast. So I wanna show you the selection of cheeses I'm working with here because this is super exciting. Not only because one, these are all so delicious, but two, these are all vegan. So we have some smoked Gouda. Then we have a cheddar here, which honestly, this looks like an artisanal cheddar that you could probably get at some like fancy cheese shop, but it's vegan. All right, so to our bread, we're gonna add our cheese. I'm gonna do smoked Gouda in this one. We're gonna do two slices. We're gonna close her up and then it's battering time. Take your bread, give her a nice dunk. Nice and coated. Okay, to our hot skillet, we're gonna get in some vegan butter. We want the butter to melt and get nice and bubbly, just like it is here. So you wanna see that nice sizzle on the edges and you'll see that it's starting to get golden. You could give it a little bit of a press to make sure that all sides of the bread are cooking evenly. We want to cook our French toast for about five minutes on each side. It should be a nice golden brown color and that's when you'll know that the batter is cooked. This is looking fantastic. The color is great. You could see the cheese is melting. Feels crisp to touch, so we're gonna remove this bad boy. Let's build our second sandwich. So our sandwiches look amazing, but we still have some leftover batter, but we don't need to waste this because this is not like the traditional egg batter from a French toast. So we're actually gonna make my version of chewy, which are chickpea flour based pancakes. So we already have our skillet here. And to this, we're gonna add some neutral oil. We want a good amount of oil here because this is gonna be like a little bit like a shallow fry of the batter. Give these a flip. Beautiful. That's exactly what we're looking for, that golden brown. 
We have our French toast, we have our chewy pancakes, so I'm ready to serve everything up. So what I like to do is I like to take the French toast and cut it in half so we can reveal the beautiful inside. So first, we're gonna drizzle it with the traditional maple syrup. Now, this might sound weird, but the sweetness of the maple syrup goes really well with the spice. Kind of think of it like eating bacon with maple syrup, but this is not bacon. We're gonna add a little bit of chaat masala. So chaat masala is probably one of the most widely used spice mixes in India, and it has a bunch of different spices, like mango powder, which is a little bit tangy, black salt, which kind of has that umami salty flavor, cumin, coriander, so many things. And we're gonna add a little cheek of lemon because this is gonna add that freshness and brightness that's gonna go really well with every bite you take. There we have it. We're gonna take our French toast, we're gonna do a little dunk. Oh my God. Mmm. It's like I never left India. The chilies, the coriander, they're so fresh and so vibrant, and I love the textures on this, and we did this all in just 30 minutes. How cool is that? Gyros are an iconic Greek staple. Now traditionally, the meat is stacked on a vertical spit so you can get a, a mix of crispy and juicy meat pieces. Thankfully, for my version, you don't need a giant spit in your kitchen. <laughs> so my marinade is really simple. We're just gonna use a little bit of lemon. I'm gonna slice this. I'm gonna squeeze in some lemon juice. Squeeze it into a bowl. Also gonna be adding in some red wine vinegar. And then some personality for this, we're gonna keep it really simple and adding in some dried oregano. Pinch of salt and some fresh cracked pepper. Whisk this up. There you go. Now I'm gonna set this aside and we're gonna move on to our chicken breast. All right, so I'm gonna butterfly this chicken first just to get it a little bit thinner. And when we thin it out, you can have and much more even cooking throughout the chicken. Open it up and it makes a beautiful little heart just like this. So now, we're gonna flatten this out a little bit more. I'm gonna take some plastic wrap. I'm gonna add one of the pieces to it. I'm gonna use this mallet, it's a little bit easier. We're just gonna flatten it out. If you have a rolling pin as well for baking, use that. Again, we're just trying to flatten this out. This is not a contest that you're at the local fair trying to win a teddy bear for somebody. We're gonna add our piece of chicken right here to our marinade. So I'm gonna let this rest at room temperature, but you can also do this as a make-ahead recipe and do it overnight, but not too long because the chicken will come out mushy. Now you can't have a gyro without a creamy yogurt sauce, and here is my speedy one. So we're gonna line a bowl with some heavy-duty paper towels and grate this cucumber right into the bowl. And the reason we're doing this is cucumber is it's a whole lot of water. 
There we go, looks just like this. Now, I'm gonna make this sweat just a bit by adding in a pinch of salt. Mm. Now we're gonna set this aside, let this rest, and then prepare the rest of our sauce. Starting off here with some thick Greek yogurt, super high in protein. We're gonna make this really bright today. <laughs> let this whole lemon. And then I am a garlic lover. I know I like a little bit of breast stink in my recipe, so I'm gonna use at least one, but if you use two, I would not be mad about that at all. Garlic adds a whole lot of flavor. Hit it with a splash of vinegar. Some red wine vinegar. I like dill, so I'm kinda heavy-handed with it. There we go. Pinch of sea salt. Some black pepper. And then we're gonna finish it off with some heart healthy olive oil. Again, this is my version. I don't want all the Greek grandmothers outside my door telling me, this is not right, Kev. No, this is just hero ish, tzatziki ish, okay? Mix this together. Don't worry, I have not forgot about our cucumber. We're gonna mix this first. Look at that. Beautiful, creamy sauce. Head back to check on our cucumber. Exactly what we want here, squeeze it. You don't have to go overboard here either. I mean, if you're squeezing so hard that it's tearing through the paper towel, it could either be the paper towel or it could just be you, Hercules. <laughs> and now just fold everything together. Look how beautiful this is. Mmm, our tzatziki is looking really good. It's time to get our veggies. Now our grill pan is nice and hot. I'm gonna hit it with a little bit of avocado oil to spray, boom. And to take our chicken, shake off some of the excess marinade. In goes the chicken. We love that sound. Pinch of salt, just a little pinch, don't need much. So we're gonna cook this chicken for about four minutes on each side. Ready for the flip, here we go. One, two, three, flipping it over, boom. Look at that. Beauty! Look at them grill marks, y'all. <laughs> and as it's finishing up, I'm just gonna squeeze a little bit more lemon on there. Just some citrus love. Woo! Look at that. Is it ready? And it lifts all the way up very easily. Boom. And if you need to, you can spray your grill pan just a little bit more. Shake off the excess marinade, and in goes the other piece of chicken. Now keep this grill hot. I'm gonna do a light spray, some oil. Now we still have the flavor from the chicken and the marinade there. I'm gonna put our pitas right on in there. Then gently press down, just make sure it's not burning. We just wanna cook it long enough where there's a little bit of color on there. All right, this is really nice. I'm gonna turn off our pan. So we let our chicken rest for about five minutes, so now all those juices won't run out as we slice it up. And now it's time to build our sandwich. We got our fresh veggies here. We're making gyros, we're making gyros. Okay, so we're gonna open up our pita here. Gonna add in some of our creamy tzatziki. And then add in some lettuce. Stuff it all the way up in there. Get some tomato. A Little bit of onion action here. And then don't forget the feta. It's like a double cream factor with the tzatziki. And then take our chicken, mm hmm and just load this bad boy up. Oh, wow. All right, this looks amazing. Can't wait to take a bite. Mm hmm I mean, if that was a mic, I'm dropping it right there. So darn easy, so darn delicious. Mm. by Walmart. Welcome to the Today All Day Kitchen. We're turning everyday leftovers into brand new dishes for the Today Table. With a little imagination and a few fresh ingredients, we'll show you how to make amazing next day dishes. I'm starting off your morning right with a hearty protein-packed quiche. 
the perfect lunch or anytime snack. Crispy rice cakes with the perfect savory toppings. And I'm making a velvety chocolate mousse with a surprising ingredient. Get ready. Because we're clearing out the fridge. And leaving no leftover behind. You can shop the ingredients featured here from our sponsor, Walmart, by scanning the QR code. Today earns a commission from purchases made through links on today.com. Whenever I'm doing meal prep, I usually end up with a few leftover ingredients. Today, I'm using some leftover rotisserie chicken to make a quiche with spinach, feta, and sun-dried tomatoes. So, let's get started with our crust. I've got some store-bought pie crust right here, and I'm gonna lightly flour my surface. You don't need too much. All the hard work has been done for us. We're just gonna roll out our pie crust and be really gentle with it because it is pretty fragile. All right, I'm gonna sprinkle the pie crust with a little bit of flour and we are going to roll this out. Just gently enlarge it so that way it'll fit comfortably inside of our pie pan. Okay, I've got this rolled out really nicely. So I'm gonna take my pie pan I'm just gonna put it right on top of it, just like this. And just take your fingers and lightly go around the edges. I'm telling you, the first time I did this, I felt super accomplished, because I'm like, I'm a baker now. I'm, I'm baking. Mama, look at me. And then you're gonna take these edges that are falling over. You're gonna just fold them up under here, so that way you kind of get an even crust. This is the Today All Day Kitchen, right? So we're gonna just make it a little bit fancier. So after I get done doing this, we're gonna add some texture and some form to this pie crust. And all you're gonna do, it's a trick I learned. You're gonna take your finger right up under here and crimp it down, press down, and pull it out. Down, and pull it out. All the way like this. And go all the way around the pie crust. I know, the first time I did this, I was like, yo, Kev, look at you. He's a baking machine. And keep going around the edges. All right, got the last one here. All right, now look at this. It looks like it's from a bake shop, right? I know, I did it myself. And you could do it too. So, with our pie crust ready, it is camera ready. We're gonna let this rest in the fridge while I prep the rest of the ingredients. Next thing we're gonna prep is our spinach. All right, I'm going to set a stainless steel skillet on a medium high heat. In goes a little bit of water. That's all we wanna see. Watch this, boom. In goes the spinach. It's like the Wizard of Oz, it's melting, it's melting. You shouldn't have to cook the spinach for more than one minute. And boom, this is just about right because I don't want it to be completely mushy. I'm gonna take it out. All right, spinach is cooked. Move on to the other star, the sun-dried tomatoes. All right, we're gonna stack our tomatoes together. Just take a knife. And we're just gonna dice them. Look at all this goodness. And they're very fragrant too. Now, moving on to my leftover rotisserie chicken. We're gonna take the skin off of the chicken. Peel that back. I know some of y'all are just moaning right now, like, <laughs> what are you doing? It's all right, don't worry. There's still a lot of flavor in this dish and you're not gonna miss it. Just going to make sure that there are no bones in here. And you can pull it apart with your hands first, especially if it's cold and left over. If it's warm from just purchasing it, then you may have to use some forks. But I just like to get in there and just use my hands. But of course you do what's most comfortable for you. And try not to do a little bit of this, which I am so guilty of. But you know, a little tasting along the way isn't a bad thing. What home cook doesn't nibble and taste along the way? That's how you know it's good. Let's move on with the recipe. Next part that we have to do, we've got to prep our eggs. So I'm gonna be using some whole eggs. If you are teen lean and mean and you wanna Wonderful, delicious egg white quiche. Mmm, can't wait to wake up to that on the weekend. <laughs> I'm kidding, I eat egg white. But for this one, my leftovers deserve whole eggs. Extra protein, a little extra fat, a little extra love. That's all I'm saying. Add in a little bit of milk. Whisk this up 
and we're gonna season it with a little bit of sea salt and pepper for the culture. Boom, salt, pepper. The internet will let you know if you cook unseasoned food right away. And I'm pretty sure our today all day kitchen fam is no different. <laughs> there we go. Now it is time to bring together our beautiful quiche. I'm gonna add in our chicken. Just spread it out. This is gonna be a really meaty protein pack quiche. And you wanna spread it out very well on the pie crust to make sure that every slice gets a little bit of that protein. There we go. Adding in some of our sun-dried tomatoes. Sprinkle those around as well. In goes the spinach. There we go. Our last bit of a protein boost and flavor boost. The feta, just kind of crumble it up. I bought this crumble, but if you want to buy the entire block, just use a fork to crumble it up on a plate and then do it. There we go. Now, let's give this one more whisk and we're gonna pour in our egg. Watch the slow pour. Getting a little bit more, just some texture on top. Quack pepper. Boom. Look at this beauty. It looks amazing before we've even baked it. This is what we want. We're gonna bake this beauty for about 45 minutes at 350 or until the center is set. I've let this cool for about 15 minutes. It's still really warm, so it's perfect. You can see when I move it, there's no movement there. Let's dig in. I'm gonna give myself a nice, generous portion of this. Oh my gosh, and look how creamy it is. Look at it. The heat has just made that feta just even creamier. I can't wait to dig in. Self-control and portion control is gonna be hard with this one, so don't write me and complain. Kev, I ate the whole thing. <laughs> I understand. Mm, mm. I guarantee you, your friends, your family will love this. Whenever I order takeout, I usually have a ton of rice left over. You could always just reheat and eat what you've got, but I love making crispy rice cakes. So many different cultures have their own version of crispy rice, and now it is all over TikTok, so I cannot wait to show you mine. We are going to start with our rice, and I have three cups right here. So we're gonna add a couple other things to it to boost its flavor and also make sure that it all sticks together and doesn't fall apart when frying. So what we wanna do is we just wanna take some cornstarch right here, and we are going to add in a little bit of water, and then we're actually gonna add in some lemon. We're just going to whisk it on up into a slurry. It smells fabulous, super fragrant. We are going to pour it over the top of the rice. I'm also going to season it with some kosher salt. A nice little three finger pinch. And then we are just going to fold it all together. 
Here I have an eight by eight square baking dish and I have lined it with some plastic wrap. So we're just going to take that rice, pop it directly into the pan and with our fingers, which I find clean hands can honestly be the best tools in the kitchen, we are going to just press that rice down into the corners of the pan. Looking good. It is always so much fun to take leftovers and turn them into something new and awesome. I think that a lot of people don't realize the beauty of half of the work already being done for you. We're going to freeze it for at least one hour, up to two hours. And while that's freezing, I'm gonna get some of my toppings ready. I love topping my rice cakes with the perfect soft boiled egg. So I'm gonna show you how to make the perfect one, my little tips and tricks to do it. First thing you wanna do, boil some water. I am going to take a spider, you could also take a slotted spoon, and delicately lower those eggs one by one into the boiling water. While those eggs are going, let's get to work on our lemony scallion yogurt sauce. Starting off, I have two cleaned scallions right here. What we're going to do is we're going to trim off the root of those scallions, and then we will slice them on an angle, also known as a bias, into really thin rounds. So we'll just take that, pop it directly into the sauce, and then we are going to take that lemon half that we have from earlier, squeeze all that juice right into the yogurt, and then we're gonna hit it with a little bit of salt to awaken its flavor. So we're gonna mix this up, and there you go. We have our yogurt sauce. And it almost looks like a looser version of scallion cream cheese. Our eggs are done, we are going to strain them and immediately transfer them into our ice bath. And what the ice bath is gonna do is it's going to shock the eggs and immediately stop them from continuing to cook. Another thing that I love about an ice bath is as that egg cools, what's going to happen is the white is going to slowly pull back from the shell, creating a really thin layer that will allow us to peel these eggs beautifully. Okay, our eggs have been chilling out and it is time to crack them. So what I'll do is I'll take the egg and I will tap it on a flat surface to break up that shell. And then here's my trusty sidekick. Say hello to the spoon. We wanna make sure that the spoon goes underneath that coating and the spoon is going to do a gorgeous job of lifting that shell right off. Wow. How satisfying is that? I mean, come on, you guys, take a look at that. Absolutely perfect soft boiled egg. Our rice is nice and frozen and it is time to fry them up. So we're going to start by adding avocado oil to our skillet. We are going to heat this up until it is shimmering and while we're waiting for that to heat up, let's slice up our rice. We're going to take that overhang that we have and delicately lift the rice block out. Look at how great that looks. Pull it back. And then what I like to do to make sure that we have even squares is I like to slice off about a half of an inch off of the sides of the rice. And you really wanna make sure that you're using a sharp knife here. Fabulous. Take this, compost it, and then we are going to cut these into nine even pieces, about two inches by two inches. We are going to crisp these up for about five minutes per side until we get a nice golden brown crust on the exterior. Set your timers. These are looking really good and now it is time to flip. Ooh, gorgeous golden. We love to see that. The 
These are looking beautiful. We're gonna transfer them to a wire rack lined baking sheet. And we wanna salt these rice cakes while they are still hot so that they can hold on to the salt that hits them. Okay, I'm going to fry up this next batch and then it will be the moment we're all waiting for, topping the rice cakes and eating them. You can top these any way you like, but I'm gonna show you my favorite way to serve these crispy rice cakes. We'll start with our beautiful avocado. Whenever I'm picking an avocado, I always wanna make sure that when I press down, it has a little bit of give. Another great way to test is I'll look at the top of the avocado where the stem is. If you pull the stem out and you see that the inside is a nice bright green color, that is how you know the avocado is perfectly ripe. So we are going to take a sharp knife we will insert it into the top of the avocado until you hit the pit. And then delicately roll the avocado around, slicing through to cut it in half. Look at that, absolutely gorgeous. As far as peeling the avocado is concerned, instead of scooping it out with a spoon, I love to peel the skin off with my fingers. And then we are going to take the avocado and with the tip of our knife, we will slice into thin strips. I just really love how fancy it looks when you slice it. I think adding a nice, punchy, bright element with a lemon wedge is an awesome way to just give a little extra oomph to your overall presentation. Next up, we have our eggs. This is a really fun trick that I love to use when I am serving these eggs on our crispy rice. You're gonna take your egg. If you want, you can dunk it in a little bit of water or you could even just roll it in that residual lemon just to get it slightly wet. And then what you're going to do is you're gonna take that seasoning and you're going to roll the egg into the Everything Bagel seasoning. I'm a big fan of Everything Bagel seasoning, huge fan. And once this is nicely seasoned, you'll take your sharp knife and slice right through revealing that perfect jammy yolk. Are you kidding me? I mean, how stunning is that? That is incredibly satisfying. So let's bring back one of our crispy rice pieces. This one has that avocado on it. And for this one, some of our pastrami smoked salmon. I love pastrami smoked salmon. So it's just your traditional smoked salmon, except it has pastrami spice on it. Now I'm gonna plate these up and make them even more gorgeous with our sauce. And what I like to do is just create a really beautiful swoosh on the bottom of the platter. And just spread it into a really beautiful layer. Now it is time to adorn our platter with our crispy rice. So remember those green scallion tops that we saved earlier? We are going to take them and just sprinkle them over the tops just for a little extra jewelry and flavor. Okay, I can't contain myself. I have to try one of these. I'm gonna take a little lemon, squeeze it over the top. Let's give it a taste. Okay, first of all, you hear that crunch? That is stunning. I just have to say that this is one reason why you should never toss out your leftover rice. I promise you, you can always put it to good use.
When I first went vegan, I thought I'd had to give up chocolate desserts for good, since so many dessert recipes include dairy or eggs. But now, my day isn't complete without something chocolatey and sweet. It didn't take long for me to discover the magic of aquafaba. What is that, you ask? Well, it's the leftover ingredient that's the key to my fluffy chocolate mousse. And it's actually found in a can of chickpeas. But before we get to that, let's start melting some chocolate. So I have my chocolate here over a double boiler, so let's turn on the heat. We wanna set this to a slow simmer. And there's all different varieties of vegan chocolate. I'm using mini chips, but they also have chunks, they have big chips, and it also comes in whole bars. I like the mini chips because they melt quickly, they're easy to work with, and I just wanna get my mousse done quickly, so why not go the easy route? Our water is at a slow, gentle simmer, so our chocolate is gonna start melting. You wanna make sure to continuously stir it so then that the heat can be distributed throughout the chocolate and it'll melt evenly. Okay, so once all the chips are melted, our next ingredient for our mousse base is some vegan sweetened condensed milk. This is made entirely from coconut and it is so good, it's gonna add a nice creamy base and really thicken up that chocolate and kind of make it a ganache consistency. Now, you can flavor this however you'd like, but I like mine a little bit luxurious and indulgent, so we're gonna give this an amaretto flavor. So it's gonna be a bit of almond, a bit of vanilla. It's gonna taste like Italy. So to this, we're gonna add one ounce of amaretto liquor. Once the liquor is incorporated, we're gonna add in two flavorings, a splash of vanilla and a splash of almond. Almond extract smells so good, but a little goes a long way. It's very strong, so make sure to just add a tiny splash because otherwise it'll become too bitter and overwhelm the whole dish. And it should look like this, glossy and thick almost like the consistency of a ganache. So this looks great, so I'm gonna remove it from the heat and let it cool completely. So while our chocolate cools, we can work on our secret ingredient, our aquafaba. So aquafaba may sound fancy, but all it is is the water from a can of chickpeas. Instead of tossing this, which most people do, if you whip aquafaba up, it turns into a consistency almost of an egg white or like a meringue. You can use it in all different ways. The way I would think about aquafaba is the same as egg whites. So if you were to use egg whites in a dish or even whipped cream, you can substitute it with aquafaba. I recommend getting a can of low sodium or no salt added chickpeas. That way the water doesn't affect the flavor of what you're making. So what we wanna do is to our stand mixer fitted with the whip attachment, we want to make sure that our bowl is chilled. So right before I whip up my aquafaba, I like to keep my bowl in the fridge for at least 10 to 15 minutes so it gets ice cold. And the reason why we want to do that is because it'll then help us whip up the aquafaba so it turns into stiff peaks. If it's too warm, then it's not gonna whip up and it's just gonna fall flat. So lock in your mixer and we're gonna set it to high. So I'm gonna stop the mixer because I wanna add a little bit of cream of tartar. This is gonna help stiffen up the peaks and get us that nice, glossy, stiff peak that we're looking for in a chocolate mousse. So let's go ahead and add that in and turn on mixer back on high. Let's give it another minute or two to get it real stiff because the stiffer it is, the more delicate and airy our mousse is gonna be. Okay, our aquafaba's looking good. Yep, this is exactly what we want. A stiff peak, it doesn't fall. So now we want to fold our aquafaba into our melted chocolate that's been cooled. We start with a little bit and you gently fold it in. If I just sat here and stirred it, it would turn into a soup and it would not set into a mousse. So we wanna make sure we're adding in as much air as possible. 
So I keep folding until I don't see any more streaks and then I go in with some more dollops of aquafaba. Okay, this looks beautiful. So we're ready for our next dollop. This is looking great, it's all an even color. So now I just have to get into little jars so it can set in the fridge. So I'm gonna clear up my area so I can do that. So we're gonna pour this in here and set it in the fridge overnight. So our mousse have set overnight and they look beautiful. You can see they're perfectly set. There's no liquid. You can see all of the beautiful air bubbles. It does not look vegan, let me tell you. I'm garnishing these with fresh cherries, but you can easily use a jarred cherry like an amarena, which will go really well with this. Okay, now I think it's fair to say that I have been waiting way too long to actually dig into this. So why don't we go for a taste? you believe this texture? This is made from chickpea water. No egg whites, no dairy, chickpea water. All right, you ready? Wow. It's so airy, yet so decadent. I hope this inspires you guys to cook low waste and zero waste recipes at home and try this mousse. But for now, I'm gonna keep enjoying and indulging. Mm. Sponsored by Walmart. Welcome to the Today All Day Kitchen. We're serving up the best brunch ever for the Today Table. This morning, we're cooking up three cozy dishes that will satisfy anyone on Team Savory or Team Sweet. I'll be making cheesy loaded potato waffles with bacon. And I'll be whipping up a decadent French toast bake with a banana's foster sauce. And I'm making three colorful rainbow smoothie bowls with homemade granola. Whether you're planning a special meal or just want to make the weekends more fun, it's time to build a better brunch. You can shop the ingredients featured here from our sponsor Walmart by scanning the QR code. Today earns a commission from purchases made through links on today.com. When I was a kid, my mom made most of the meals during the week. But on the weekends, my dad took charge of breakfast duty. French toast was his specialty, so I'm getting super nostalgic today with an amped up version of my childhood fave. The Bananas Foster Sauce takes French toast to the next level in this recipe. I mean, who doesn't love a little rum in the morning? But first, let's get started with the luscious custard. I'm going to start by combining all of my dry ingredients 
We are going in with one cup of granulated sugar. We are going to add in one teaspoon of kosher salt. I'm also going to be adding in some warming spices. So we have our classic ground cinnamon right here. And then as an optional add-on, I'm also going to be adding in some ground nutmeg and some ground ginger powder. My dad only used cinnamon, but I wanted to give it a little bit of a restaurant quality twist. Next up, we are going to add our wet ingredients. We have heavy cream. This is going to make it super rich and luxurious. We have some whole milk. We'll whisk this on up. We're going to add in one teaspoon of vanilla extract. I'm actually going to crack my eggs into this measuring cup and then I will put them into the large bowl. The reason why is if I accidentally get any shells, I'll be very easily able to remove them. Going to break up all of these yolks and give it a nice whisk. We will add that into our liquid mixture. And this is a standard custard that we've just made here. Okay, so now that our custard is done, we are going to butter our nine by 13 inch baking dish. My favorite way to butter a dish is to actually use a paper towel. It does a really great job of grabbing onto the butter and allowing you to get into all of those nooks and crannies. We are using challah bread today. It just does such a good job of absorbing that custard and it gives you a really creamy French toast that still has a nice crispy exterior. So we have sliced up this challah into one inch thick pieces and we've dried it out. When you dry out your bread, it actually does a better job of absorbing all of the custard. Okay, time to delicately pour our custard over the top of this French toast. And something that I also really like to do is I'll just take these pieces and kind of press them down into the custard, give it a nice custard bath. It's so funny because when I think about the French toast that my dad used to make, super simple. It was white bread, egg, milk. He didn't even measure it. But the best thing was the song that he sang. He used to, <laughs> while he'd be making the French toast, he would sing this song. And I remember it very vividly to this day. It goes, French toasty, French toasty. It's the toasty with the mosty. And he would just sing it over and over again. And he'd be like, sing it with me. And we'd be like, French toasty, French toasty. It's the toasty with the mosty. Good times, uh, the good old days to be a kid. I like to cover this and pop it into the refrigerator for at least one hour to soak up all of that custardy goodness. Then when I'm ready to bake, I will preheat my oven to 350 degrees pop this into the oven and cook it for about 40 to 45 minutes. While our French toast is baking up in the oven, I'm gonna get started on our bananas foster sauce. We have three medium ripe bananas and we're just going to peel them. And this is a really fun alternative to maple syrup. And then I like cutting these on a bias. It just looks really elevated when you slice it on an angle. We'll do the same with the rest of these. We're gonna toast them up before we serve them. So we'll turn our heat to low, add in one tablespoon of unsalted butter. Now that our butter is nice and bubbly, we are going to add our bananas into the pan. Toss those in there. We just wanna get some nice caramelization. The butter is also going to flavor those bananas really nicely. And as you can see, they're getting a nice, subtle, golden color to them. All right, 
So we've gotten some of that brown consistency on the bottom here. We are going to transfer these bananas over and we'll get to work on our sauce. This is the fun part. We are going to add in our one stick of butter. We're going to combine it with one cup of brown sugar. Whisk this all together. And what we're looking for here is a nice silky brown sugar sauce. And we want the brown sugar to completely dissolve. It is the moment we've all been waiting for. It is time to flambe. We are adding in a quarter cup of spiced rum to our mixture. Here we go. There we go. Be really careful. And then we are going to turn off the heat. We're going to add in a quarter cup of heavy cream. This is optional. I just like adding a little extra creaminess to our sauce. A pinch of salt to awaken the flavor. <laughs> you guessed it. One teaspoon of vanilla extract and a half a teaspoon of ground cinnamon. We're gonna whisk this on up. And there you have it, our Bananas Foster sauce. Stunning. Our French toast is out of the oven, looking gorgeous and golden. I love to let it sit for about 10 minutes before cutting into it because it's super hot. And when I serve this up, I love to take the bananas and just adorn the tops of the French toast with those golden banana pieces. Let's slice into this thing. And then handy dandy fish spatula, really nice and bendy, gets into those nooks and crannies of the pan. We'll lift that out. Look at that. I'm gonna take a little sneak bite. Oh yeah, check that out. Should we give it a taste? I need a bit of banana. The perfect bite. Cheers. Man oh man, this is a hug. It is transporting me back to my childhood. I know my dad would love this. You know what? This tastes so good, it makes me want to sing. French toasty, French toasty. It's the toasty with the mosty. Yeah. These crispy potato waffles are packed with tons of flavor, but wouldn't be brunch without the star, 
bacon. So I'm gonna start off by showing y'all my favorite way to make bacon. I'm gonna get a baking tray and then a baking rack. Now I love doing this because you're gonna get all of the bacon fat drippings right here in this pan. But we're not gonna waste the drippings, we're actually gonna use them to cook up the onion and the garlic for later on. Now I'm gonna cook this in the oven for about 13 to 15 minutes at 420 degrees. So next, we are going to mince up some garlic and slice up some onion. We're gonna dice up the onion pretty small because remember, we're gonna fold this into our potato mash batter. Smash up some garlic, mince it up. Just mash these up. And when you're making this recipe too, I find that it's easier to use cold ingredients just because whenever we're mixing everything together, <laughs> it's going to hold. That's beautiful. Now I'm going to just to grate some cheese. I think cheddar is the way to go for this recipe. Okay, our potatoes are mashed, the cheese is grated, onions and garlic are minced and ready to go, and I smell bacon. Ah. We're gonna take our strips of bacon, place them here, nice and crispy, and we're gonna use some of the oil, you get the drippings. We're gonna add that to our skillet so we can fry up the onion. We're gonna set our skillet to a medium heat, and while that's heating up, I'm gonna start to chop up the bacon. And mm -hmm. This is the hardest part of the recipe, because you're gonna wanna start eating it. It's so good. Mm. In go the onion and garlic. Yeah, get that nice little sizzle. Now, while that's cooking up, let's begin to bring everything together. I'm gonna add in some eggs. Crack the eggs in there. I'm just gonna break up the yolks just a little bit. And then add in the star crispy bacon. We're gonna fold in a little bit of yogurt. This is some Greek yogurt, our cream factor. It's also gonna boost the protein a little bit as well. Keep stirring those onions, or you know, you gotta keep moving when it's brunch time. Multitasking in the kitchen. It is a must. Then, I'm also gonna add in some flour, especially because we've added in some wet ingredients. Sprinkle in a little bit of flour. And then in goes the cheese. Pinch of salt. And then some more black pepper. Now, let me show you something. These onions are looking great. Let the onions rest on a paper towel just to drain out some of the excess oil. Great color. There you go. Spread it out. Adding in now the onion and garlic, our flavor to this recipe. Boom. Now let's mix it together the same way that you would a waffle batter. All right, and look at this. This is the way that your batter should look. All this cheesy goodness with bacon and chunks of potato. All right, I'm gonna clean this up and grab my waffle maker. So my waffle iron is preheated to a medium high heat so we get a nice crisp on there. And since it's already nice and hot, I'm gonna spray it with a little bit of avocado oil. Boom. And then in goes our potato batter. Look at this goodness. Mm. Spread it out there. Not too much, not too heavy handed. Pat it down and then mash it. Boom. Spin it. And then just wait. Wait for the goodness to come to life. We are nearing the five minute mark. So we're gonna flip it and build the better brunch. Here we go, one, two, three, open it up. Whoa, and you see all of the crispiness. You see this golden color because that's also the cheese. Oh, the cheese has helped it to get nice and crispy on the outside. Look at that beauty, oh my gosh. All right, let's add our toppings. So I'm gonna top it off with a little bit of Greek yogurt, a little dollop here. Looks kind of like whipped cream, right? Then a little bit of green onion action. 
some leftover bacon. <laughs> Who has leftover bacon in their house? Come on, let's just be real. And then a little bit of cheese. Here we go. Boom. Beautiful. And for the homie in your kitchen, boom. All right, I gotta get into this and do the hard job and taste it for the internet since you can't be here. You can taste it pretty soon in your own kitchen though. You hear the crunchiness? Look at that. Oh, that potato. There we go. This is a perfect brunch meal and guess what? It's so filling. I know for certain you will have a better brunch if you make these crispy potato waffles. Brunch is a great way to spend time with family and friends over delicious food. But for me, it's also about posting beautiful food pics on the gram. Today I'm making three nutrient-packed smoothie bowls that are pleasing to the eye and even more pleasing to eat. First up, I'm gonna get started with a crunchy topping, my saffron cardamom granola. So I'm gonna start with my saffron syrup. So the first step is to add equal parts water and sugar. We want to stir it constantly until the sugar is completely dissolved and it comes to a simmer. And once that sugar is dissolved, we're going to add in our beautiful saffron threads. Look at that color. It's really starting to get dark and beautiful. Okay, so my saffron syrup is done, so I'm going to cut the heat. I'm gonna pour my saffron syrup into a mason jar so I can cool it and store it. And as it cools, it's gonna thicken up a bit more. So this is not a traditional granola by any means. So first, we're gonna start with our liquids. We have coconut oil here, and to this, we're gonna add our cooled saffron syrup. Still can't get over the color, gorgeous. And then we also wanna add a pinch of ground cardamom. We're gonna do two pinches for good luck. A pinch of salt and some freshly grated nutmeg. So we're gonna add in all of our dry ingredients for our granola. So first, our rolled oats, our pumpkin seeds, our sliced almonds, and our coconut chips. So you get that all in along with your chia seeds. And I first like to just give this a toss because I don't want any big clumps once we pour in our liquids. Great. 
our beautiful coconut oil and saffron syrup mixture goes in. Make sure to just give it a good whisk so that you don't have separation. So you pour that over. Make sure to get all those beautiful saffron threads. And then you give this a light toss. Okay. And then we wanna pour it onto a parchment lined baking sheet. And then we wanna spread this evenly. If you don't spread it evenly, it's all gonna just bake up into a clump. And the idea is to make sure that it gets nice and crisp. After I take my granola out of the oven, I'm gonna mix in some of my favorite dried fruits. And we wanna do that after it comes out of the oven because we don't want these to burn and we want them to stay juicy. So we have some dates, some dried cherries, and some dried cranberries. All right, let's get our granola into the oven. I'm all set up to make my rainbow smoothie bowls and I'm making three. The first is a mango turmeric smoothie bowl. The second is a dragon fruit rose smoothie bowl. And the third is a blue spirulina banana smoothie bowl. So let's talk about these dragon fruits. As you can see, they are absolutely gorgeous and they come in all different varieties. Yellow, pink, sometimes they're white inside, sometimes they're pink or red inside, sometimes they're gigantic like this one. But don't be intimidated because they're actually quite soft. And she's a beautiful pink one. Look how gorgeous that is. Also, this kind of matches my earrings. I have dragon fruit earrings on. The thing that I love about these smoothie bowls is they all have the same consistent base. So it's actually much easier than they look. They all start out with a coconut milk ice cube base. So we wanna start with one can of full fat coconut milk. And then we're just gonna give it a little whisk. We're gonna take our full fat coconut milk and pour it right into the tray. Easy peasy. You wanna make sure to fill it to the top. So one can of full fat coconut milk should basically fit into one standard size ice cube tray. It's like it was made for this. And now we're gonna pop this into the freezer and freeze overnight until solid. Now I'm gonna make my mango turmeric smoothie bowl. So we wanna get about one cup of the frozen coconut milk ice cubes into the blender. And now we're gonna add one cup of frozen mango. Get that right in. So we're gonna add in about half a teaspoon of turmeric. And to this, we're gonna actually add, I know this is gonna sound weird, but a pinch of black pepper. And then we wanna add a little bit of agave. So add that right in. And then a splash of unsweetened plant milk. I'm using oat milk, just a little splash. And then we blend it up. You may need to scrape down the sides in between to make sure 
all of the coconut and the mango and everything in there blends together. All right, just looking thick and creamy. So we're gonna pour this into our serving bowl. Look at that texture and color. Beautiful. Oh my God, this is making me so hungry. And now we're gonna get started on my second one, which is the Dragon Fruit Rose Smoothie Bowl. So this starts off with the same base. And then we're gonna add some frozen pink dragon fruit. Look how gorgeous this is. We're gonna add a little bit of rose essence. And then we're gonna get blending. So bright and vibrant. And no artificial food colorings, people. One more little blitz and we're ready to go. How beautiful is this? And now I'm gonna make my third smoothie bowl, my spirulina banana smoothie bowl. Like every other smoothie bowl, we're gonna start with the same base. Next, we're gonna add in a cup of frozen banana. And the star of the show for this smoothie bowl is blue spirulina. So while this may look artificial, it is completely natural, it is vegan, and it's actually made from an algae. So it's from under the sea, which is why it's blue. I am so happy with this color. I cannot wait to top off these smoothie bowls. So I have my beautiful saffron cardamom granola here. So we're gonna crack that open and that's gonna be our first topping. I love the complement of the saffron and cardamom with the mango, very Indian-esque, which is fitting for me. Gorgeous. I love these little circles. We used a melon baller to scoop these out. Stunning. And that's it. They literally look like they taste like the rainbow, but I think I really have to go in for the blue spirulina banana one. Oh my God. This is so delicious. I mean, just look at that texture. It's like a pina colada in your mouth but you're sitting on the beach while drinking that pina colada, something that we all want to do. So good. These rainbow smoothie bowls are a winner for any brunch table. Sponsored by Walmart. What up, y'all? Welcome to the Today All Day Kitchen. Pasta is a staple for so many weeknight meals. It's easy to make, pretty hard to screw up, and oh so satisfying. I'm making pillowy soft ricotta gnocchi with peas and parm in a buttery sauce. And I'm cooking up a creamy chicken stroganoff with baby bella mushrooms. And I'm whipping up a spicy vegan pasta alla vodka. So start boiling some water. It's time to use that noodle. And let's get cooking. You can shop the ingredients featured here from our sponsor Walmart by scanning the QR code. Today earns a commission from purchases made through links on today.com. I have to admit, pasta is one of my go-to comfort foods, so I am very excited to share this recipe with you. The first thing we want to do is take our gorgeous ricotta and actually lay it out in a thin layer on paper towels. Since the ricotta is the base of our dough, we need to remove some of that moisture so it ends up really nice and light and fluffy rather than dense. We are going to let this sit for about 12 to 15 minutes just to 
make sure that the paper towel absorbs that moisture, but lucky for me, I made one before. And here is how it ends up looking when it is done. Stunning. Okay, so now let's just make our dough. We have our ricotta right here. Plop it right on in. So we have two large eggs here. I'm going to crack them right into our bowl. One cup of finely grated Parmigiano Reggiano cheese and some kosher salt, just to awaken the flavor. Before we add in our flour, we are going to delicately mix it all together. So it creates a really light, fluffy consistency. So now that this is looking really beautifully mixed together, that is when we know it is time to start adding in our flour. It's really important here to add your flour in a quarter cup at a time because we don't want to develop too much gluten, but we also want to make sure that our ricotta stays nice and fluffy. We're just going to delicately mix it until there are no more big bits of flour, and we'll just keep mixing our final quarter cup. There we go, looking good. Now it is time to shape our gnocchi. And then we're going to take our dough mixture, kind of form it into a bit of a, it feels so good. It feels like a baby's bottom. Can we use that in the final cut? <laughs> it's what it feels like. Okay, and now we're going to dust the top with a bit more flour. And this is my favorite tool whenever I'm making pasta, also whenever I'm cooking to easily pick things up. It is called a bench scraper. It's typically used for decorating cakes, making sure you have a nice smooth line of frosting around your cake, but it does such a good job of picking things up and it also does a great job of cutting things really evenly. And we are going to cut this into quarters. And the next thing we're going to do is we are going to roll this out into a beautiful snake that is about one inch thick. It feels so nice, <laughs> so soft. I like to cut off the end first, just because this end, it doesn't look as nice. And then what I'll do is I will just keep cutting little one inch pieces of pasta. And look at that. They look like little pillows, don't they? Look at how beautiful this is looking. And what we're going to do is we'll take that same bench scraper that we have, lift them up, and transfer them to a parchment lined baking sheet. All right, and we're just going to repeat this with our remaining pieces of gnocchi dough. Looking good. Before we cook our gnocchi, I wanna get started on the star of our sauce. This is a lemon butter sauce, so we are going to be using the zest and juice of two gorgeous lemons. And I'm going to show you my favorite way to prepare lemon zest. So we're just going to take the peeler and run it along lengthwise on this lemon, pulling the zest off of the lemon. So I'm just gonna remove any of this extra pith. And the reason why I'm removing this pith is because the pith is a bit bitter and we don't want any of that bitterness. And as you can see, I've stacked up all of this lemon into cute little, almost soldiers, if you will. Take your knife and rock it back and forth along that peel. It smells amazing. And you can see how beautiful these strips are. And then what we'll do is we'll take these shreds and turn them, and then we will run our knife across again to mince that lemon. And it took me a while to master these skills, let me tell you. It really all comes down to practicing over and over and over again. It's really repetition here. 
And now I'm just gonna take my knife and run through this a few more times. It's smelling absolutely amazing. Look at that zest though, I mean, it's like freshly fallen snow. <laughs> okay, let's clean up, get our water a boiling, and finish up this gnocchi. Our water is boiling, it is time to cook our gnocchi, and you gotta pay attention because this all happens pretty quickly. But I promise you, you have all of the tools to absolutely crush it. The first thing we wanna do is salt our water. I'm taking kosher salt. Okay, this is boiling beautifully, and we can use our fingers to plop these in, because let me tell you, they are light and pillowy, and dropping them all in at once is going to cause them to smush together. We want these to cook until they float to the top, okay? They basically tell us, they're like, hey, what's up? And then to save some time, we are actually going to take our frozen peas and we're gonna pop those in as well. So this pasta water is liquid gold. I call it unicorn juice when I'm cooking because all of the starch in the water itself is actually going to help bind our sauce together. And we're going to start adding in our cubed unsalted butter a couple tablespoons at a time. You really want it to be cold butter because our goal here is to really emulsify everything. Take a whisk. Start whisking everything up. The gnocchi's starting to float. And now we are ready to bring our sauce and our gnocchi together. I've actually turned off the heat. If it is too hot, it may cause your sauce to break. So just make sure you turn that heat off. Next up, we're going to add in half of our lemon zest. How good does this look? Okay, next up, we are going to slowly add in our parm. Keep on mixing it back and forth so that it melts in a nice, even fashion. It is smelling so good. And as you can see, it is really looking super glossy. Mm, and it is tasting delish. So add in the lemon juice a little bit at a time. Again, we want to emulsify this in. We don't want to freak out the gorgeous sauce that we just worked so hard to build. It is coating all of those beautiful pillows of gnocchi. And now it is time to plate it up. Oh my gosh, you guys, how gorgeous does this look? Okay, a little extra parm, some freshly ground black pepper, and then I'll take a little bit of fresh mint, a little drizzle of olive oil, gives the pasta gorgeous sheen, and there you go, homemade ricotta gnocchi in a lemon butter sauce with peas and mint. I'm so excited to try this. It is melting in my mouth. The parm adds the perfect amount of nuttiness and saltiness. I don't have any other words to say except I know you're gonna love this. Mm.
you hear stroganoff, you're probably thinking beef, but this creamy comfort food pairs incredibly well with chicken. But the best part about this dish is that it all comes together in one pot. Less mess is always a win in my kitchen. All right, so first what we're gonna do is we're gonna make our dry rub. I like to use a little bit of smoked paprika. You can use the regular paprika too, but I think smoke flavors just bring a lot more body to your recipes. And then a little bit of dry thyme, and then a little bit of garlic powder. Give that a good swish. All right, now let's move on to our chicken breast. Now I've just got some lean, skinless chicken breasts, and I'm not sure about you, but I like to cut mine up into smaller pieces. The reason why, it's gonna cook a lot faster. All right, y'all, let's add this to our bowl. Get your hands all up in there. Don't be scared to get your hands dirty. I'm gonna just rinse off the cutting board and wash our knife so we can prep the mushrooms. Okay, now I'm gonna be using some Baby Bella mushrooms. I think they're super delicious. I'm just gonna slice this into small slices just like this. So I've got a ton of mushrooms here and you're probably thinking, yo, okay, that's not gonna fit in my pan. Don't worry, mushrooms are kinda like spinach. Once you start cooking them and add some heat to them, they shrivel up really, really small. So they will fit, I promise you that. Our mushrooms are cut up. I'm gonna set these aside. And now we're gonna fire up our pan and get cooking. All right, we're gonna place this on a medium high heat. Okay, with it nice and hot, in goes the oil. This is a little bit of olive oil, a little bit of heart health, a little sprinkle of that. Then I like to grab some tongs and in goes our chicken. Ooh, I love that sizzle sound. We want a nice sear, a nice color on the chicken. There we go. You're gonna wanna cook this for about four to five minutes on each side, and then look at this. Oh, just lift it up, and look at that beautiful color on the chicken. Move it around a little bit. If you're feeling brave, you can go ahead and toss it, but again, this is a no-mess recipe, so <laughs> the least amount of mess you can make in your kitchen, the better. This chicken is just about ready. I'm gonna move my mushrooms a little bit closer. And then, I'm gonna use my tongs. I'm gonna start taking out the pieces of chicken. Oh my God, look at that. It's just looking so good. Kev, you did that. If you're not your best cheerleader in the kitchen, I don't know what you're doing. You gotta just give yourself a pat on the back. It smells so good, it looks so good. Exactly what we want. I'm gonna set this over here. Now. I'm gonna add in the mushrooms now. Now there's a lot of chicken flavor here. Ready, so we want that. Oh, we've got a good sear here. I'm just gonna wilt them just a little bit by using a little bit of our chicken broth. Just a little bit, just to create some steam. And also this is gonna to help to deglaze the bottom of our skillet as well. I'm gonna get my salt bay on, give me a little pinch of salt, just a little bit, mm -mm. boom. And the cool thing about mushrooms is that as they're shrinking up too, you know they're just soaking up all this flavor. So people that say, I don't like mushrooms, I'm like, yo man, mushrooms are like flavor bombs. They make your mouth water. It's that umami factor. More love to mushrooms this year. Now we're gonna try to create a little bit of a thick gravy here. We're gonna add in a little bit of flour. I'm gonna give this a quick toss first. Then we're gonna add in about a cup of our chicken broth. And what you'll see here, you're gonna still deglaze, but you see now the chicken broth is really cloudy, and that's because it's turning into that gravy that we want. I'm also gonna add in a little bit of Dijon. And just keep stirring, keep stirring. And this is looking beautiful. All right, now let's begin to bring everything together. In goes our chicken broth. Reserve some, then grab yourself the egg noodles, sprinkle those on, and then pour in the rest of that broth. And the noodles are going to absorb all of this liquid that's now like a gravy. So we're gonna bring it to a light simmer and you can see right here inside that the little light simmer going. That's just about right. And then we're gonna cover and cook this for about seven minutes. 
Oh my gosh. I stirred these once. Oof. They are looking good. Always check your noodles. And if you're thinking like, Kev, it's looking a little watery. What am I gonna do? Don't worry, I got you. Remember that it's gonna thicken up as it cools, but also it's gonna thicken up because we're going to add in our Greek yogurt now. Greek yogurt is really high in protein and it's really, really, really thick. And look at this. It looks like I added cheese, but I have not at all. And this is our swap for sour cream. Last bit of work, we're gonna add in our chicken. Well, you can't be here to smell it, but I'm just gonna describe it. We need that smell of vision from Willy Wonka. So I'm gonna plate it right here and finish it off with some fresh parsley. You like some other chicken? Try this chicken stroganoff. You're seeing it first here today and then today all day kitchen. I'm just gonna hit it with some fresh black pepper. Ooh, look at that. I don't know about y'all, but I'm excited about eating. Here we go. Get a little bit of mushroom, a little bit of noodle, and then some of this succulent, lean chicken breast. Oh my God. Mm. Yeah, this will make you get happy in church. Ooh, there you go. <laughs> I guarantee your friends and family are going to love this dish. on Staten Island, so I can't even tell you how many pasta dishes I've eaten over the years. One of my absolute favorites is penne a la vodka. So today, I'm giving that beautiful pink sauce a vegan makeover. And I'm putting a little twist on that penne too. Let's get started with the crunchy breadcrumb topping. So first, I'm gonna get a small skillet over medium low heat, and we're gonna add in a little bit of olive oil. So for our breadcrumbs, we're gonna use panko breadcrumbs. I love using panko because it's extra crunchy and it's plain, so we can add anything to it and really manipulate those flavors. And the way we're gonna do that is by adding some red chili flakes because we want this spicy and a little bit of nutmeg to really round out those flavors and add that earthy component. A little bit of kosher salt and a little bit of freshly ground black pepper. And just we're gonna cook this over medium low until it gets a nice golden brown color. So we're essentially just toasting it in the pan. This usually takes about five minutes to get nice and golden and crispy. This is a test. If it loosely moves in the pan, that means it's ready. So 
So to start off any good sauce, you have to start off with your aromatics. We're gonna start with one medium white onion and some garlic. So we just wanna get a small dice on this. And next up, garlic. We're using about four cloves of garlic. I just like to give them a light crush to help me with the chopping process. Another great way to prep all of this is actually just blitzing it up in a food processor. Just putting it on chop and giving it a few pulses and it'll all be roughly chopped. So you wanna start off with a really large pan and get it over medium high heat. To this, we're gonna add a layer of olive oil and we're also gonna add in one tablespoon of vegan butter. Traditional vodka sauce is so indulgent and creamy, so we're gonna add a few vegan options to help bring that creaminess to the sauce. So now that our oil is hot and the butter is sizzling, let's go in with our onion and garlic. You also wanna get some salt in at this point because that's gonna help the onions sweat out all of their moisture. Now, I said this was spicy vodka sauce, so now come in our spicy elements. We're gonna add some red chili flakes, but let's not stop there. We're gonna add in one of my favorite chili peppers, Calabrian chilies. And I just so happen to be wearing chili earrings to celebrate the occasion. So we wanna cook these for about five minutes until the onions are sweating and almost translucent. So now let's go in with our tomato paste. The tomato paste is gonna add basically a really concentrated tomato flavor. So it's gonna feel like we've been cooking this sauce all day, but really, we haven't been. So get this incorporated into the onions. So, the star of the show, some vodka. No, this is not a shot for me. This is for the pasta, maybe that'll be later. So once we add the vodka in, all of that alcohol is gonna evaporate, so you don't have to worry about any alcohol actually being in there, but the flavor of the vodka will become concentrated, which is what adds that unique flavor to vodka sauce, which I happen to love. We're gonna go in with some crushed tomatoes. We're gonna go in with a little sugar. Now, don't hate on this. This is really gonna help balance the flavors again. There's a lot of acidity in the tomatoes, and then we also have a lot of spice, so the sugar is gonna help round everything out. As well as some dried oregano. So I actually like to take this and rub it in between my fingers to get the oils in the oregano activated. We want our spicy vodka sauce to be smooth and silky, and in order to achieve that, we're gonna use an immersion blender. This looks great, look how vibrant that is. It really is starting to look like vodka sauce. So now we're gonna add a few dairy elements to our sauce. We're gonna add a little bit of vegan creamer, as well as some vegan cream cheese. So you wanna make sure to incorporate all of that in, and you can see the color is this beautiful light orange vodka sauce color. We're gonna add in one whole sprig of fresh basil. Right in, and we're gonna let that simmer with the sauce. Okay, let's check in our pasta water. Oh, it's boiling. Before we do anything, we always wanna salt our pasta water. And now for our pasta. I just wanna show you guys how fun this is. So this is called a colony Pompeii. I think colony means column, and Pompeii is obviously a city in Italy. But to me, it's just a beautiful large fusilli, and it looks delicious to eat. So we're gonna get these in. This pasta is so big, it takes about 10 or 12 minutes to cook. So I'm gonna start cleaning up and get everything out of the way and get ready to plate.
Our pasta looks ready, so let's add it into our vodka sauce. Beautiful. This is so fun. Look at these swirls. And this is liquid gold. This is our starchy, salted water. So we're actually gonna add a little ladle into our pasta to make it even silkier. You wanna make sure to gently combine this with the sauce because we don't wanna break up our beautiful, giant swirls of pasta. Look how fun this looks. I'm so excited to eat it, but we can't forget about our spicy, crunchy breadcrumb topping. So it's now completely cooled, so we can just use our hands to garnish it as if we were garnishing it with Parmesan. And then if we wanna be extra fancy, we can add a little sprig of fresh basil. Okay, I've waited long enough, so we're now ready to dig in. I'm so excited to eat this shape. I feel like the proper way is from the bottom. Wow, I think Staten Island would be proud. This is so delicious and so fun. Look at that. Chef's kiss. This is delicious. Sponsored by Walmart. Welcome to the Today All Day Kitchen. I'm Elena Besser. I'm Priyanka Knight. I'm Kevin Curry, and we're whipping up our favorite 30 minute meals for the Today table. Don't get me wrong, I love spending time in the kitchen to unwind. But there are some days when you just want to get dinner on the table fast. So today we're making three speedy recipes that are just perfect for busy weeknights. I'm making a twist on falafel for all of you buffalo wing lovers out there. I'm making a savory stuffed French toast. I'm making chicken gyros that can be grilled up in a flash. Set your timer and set the table. It's time to get cooking. You can shop the ingredients featured here from our sponsor Walmart by scanning the QR code. Today earns a commission from purchases made through links on today.com. I absolutely love buffalo wings. I am so obsessed that I actually have a photo of wings hanging above my bed. Anyway, I also love the food and flavors from Israel. Half of my family lives there and I am always inspired by their cuisine. So today I am creating a mashup of my favorite foods, buffalo wings and falafel. The first thing I'm gonna do is jazz up my favorite hot sauce. So we are going to add in cubed butter to a saucepan over a medium heat. A nice gorgeous cup of hot sauce. You can use whatever favorite hot sauce you have on hand. And then for a little extra pizzazz, we are adding in some garlic powder. And we are going to whisk this together until all of that butter is melted and we have a nice gorgeously orange sauce. And this is going to happen very quickly. Okay, we will set this aside. Let's get going on our falafel. So to save time in this recipe, because we really wanna make sure that we keep it in the 30 minute mark, we are using canned chickpeas. I know this could be controversial, don't tell my cousins, back in Israel. We're gonna start by pulsing these up. See that? It looks really nice and ground up. So we are transferring these back into the bowl from whence they came, and we will mix up the rest of our ingredients. Shallot. A shallot is awesome. It's kind of like a combination of an onion and garlic. It has those nice garlic notes in it. So we are going to rock our knife back and forth like so until we get about a tablespoon's worth of shallot. And this is gonna go into our creamy dill sauce, which is basically like a fun 
yogurt-based version of ranch. I'm a ranch gal. If you're a blue cheese person, feel free to add a little bit of blue cheese to that mixture. Pop it into a little bowl. With the rest of this, since it's all going into the food processor, so I've got my shallot. I got one clove of garlic. We are now going to add in some chili flake. And then we are also going to add in some parsley. And we are adding in more of my favorite, <laughs> the garlic powder. Hit it with a teeny bit of salt, a little bit of freshly ground black pepper. We're gonna give it a nice fine chop. But this is really giving us a gorgeous green color. It smells so fresh. Okay, so we're just gonna take this mixture and we are going to add it to our chickpeas. In order to make sure all of this falafel goodness binds together, we are going to add in some cornstarch and then we are going to add in a little bit of baking powder to give it some lift. We're going to add some kosher salt as well. And then we are going to, again, fold this mixture together. I'm gonna go get a new pan so we can fry up our falafel. We are using neutral oil here. Pour that right into a heavy bottom skillet. I have a little scooper to help me create these into one ounce portions. You'll just kind of press that mixture into the cookie scoop. And then we're going to push it down. Okay, our oil is properly preheated. We have our falafel ready to rock. Let's fry these up. Make sure that you don't overcrowd the pan because we're going to want to move these around a bit as they cook. And we wouldn't be able to do that if it's too crowded in there. Even before I flip these, you can see how it is starting to get nice and golden brown on the edges. That is what we're looking for, and that is when we know we're getting really close to flipping these falafel. Ah, yeah. Check that out. Now that these are done and draining on a wire rack, I'm gonna sprinkle them with some salt. And then I'm gonna fry up this next batch and when we get back, we will make our creamy dill sauce.